Okay. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jonathan Watson with No Fisheries. I'm joined here by James Boyle with ASNFC. We're happy to uh, to be here for another meeting of the Atlantic Coast River Herring Collaborative Forum. This is, I believe, according to my our records, it is our uh, 22nd meeting since the name change in 2016. Um, you know, happy to report at last check we had about 119 registered, which is a slight increase. Uh, maybe from our spring meeting, but we're right in line with where we've been. Um, you know, happy to see you know, sustained interest here and, and participation and glad you guys could all carve out some time on this um, beautiful October day to um, to sit down and hear about some of the recent research and, and updates, you know, re relating to river herring. So, um, yeah, so I guess we'll jump right in with our management updates. So ASMFC, we are first. Um, <clears throat> I know our big news is the progress. I'm sure you're all very interested in hearing the progress of the river herring benchmark stock assessment. So just really quickly on the management side, um, oh, we had our board, our most recent board meeting, meeting a couple of weeks ago at the annual meeting. And uh, the most recent development is that the FMP review for the 2022 fishing year was completed, was approved at that review. So that is just on our website now. Um, if you'd like to check it out, you can see the, our annual review. And with that, I will very quickly pass it over to Katie Drew for an update on the assessment. Great, uh, thanks James. So uh, some of you are probably already know, but um, we had our assessment workshop in August of this year. So almost a month, more than a month ago now. Uh, and at that workshop, I think based on where we were and the progress we had made and what kind of additional work was still outstanding, the um, stock assessment subcommittee recommended that we basically extend the deadline for the completion of this assessment one more meeting cycle. Um, so originally we were scheduled to be complete and going to peer review um, at the end of this year and presenting to the management board in February. Um, based on sort of our current level of progress, we are now going to be completing the um, peer review in February or March. Um, and then presenting the results to the board in May. So essentially just moving that back one meeting cycle um, for the finalization of the assessment. Um, otherwise things are um, sort of mostly, on, we're still on track to meet that slightly later deadline um, and that should hopefully not have a big impact on the management response to the assessment. Um, but that's where we are with that um, timeline and I'm happy to take any questions if people have any. Not seeing any raised hands there, Katie, but you hop it on to give us an update on yep thank you for having me thanks katie so i'm going to jump right back in with the uh mid-atlantic council update jason didn't unfortunately couldn't be here today but um if you have any questions afterwards i'm sure he's happy to answer them there's a few things he wanted us to mention just to let everybody know the first thing is that the mid-atlantic council uh approved the status quo of the river herring and shad bycatch cap at 129 metric tons there was some discussion and some recommendations from the committee, the River Herring Shack Committee to reduce it to 89. But given the uh, depleted status of Atlantic mackerel, there is, they do not expect there will be a lot of directed fishing for that species for 2024, 2025. And so they'll revisit changes to the bag catch cap once there's sufficient quota for a more substantial directed mackerel fishery. Um, other than that, the other note is that for 2024 in their draft implementation plan for the Mid-Atlantic Council, which will be approved at the December Council meeting. Um, currently in that draft plan, there is a note to consider exploration of a modeling approach for shad and river herring bycatch avoidance approaches. Um, and I have the paper that that will be based on. It's based on a uh, Roberts et al. paper from earlier this year. So I'm gonna put that, uh, the link to that paper in the chat if anybody would like to read more about that and the approach that they're likely to use, assuming that that uh, item remains in the final implementation plan for 2024. Um, and that's all I have from the Mid-Atlantic Council and I'm happy to pass it over to Jamie from New England Council and I'll make her present. Thanks for giving that update for the Mid-Atlantic Council, James. And just if folks didn't catch it, you know, Jason didn't, it's usually our representative providing those updates. So if folks have questions on that, uh, thank you and good afternoon. Thanks for the opportunity to provide a brief update from the New England Fishery Management Council. I am Jamie Cornan, um, the lead for the Herring Fishery Management Plan for the Council. Just a few quick slides and can take any questions you might have. Um, first, what the main thing the Council has been working on this year is uh, there was an inshore midwater trawl closure in place for about a year. It was 
vacated by a court and the council is trying to wrestle with what to um, do in this situation and has been talking about some of the issues that were raised when that uh, restriction was in place and how to go forward. At our June council meeting, the council adopted a problem statement um, that is explaining this action that they're going to undertake will be to develop and implement management actions to um, attain optimum yield and improve the conservation status of Atlantic herring. Um, goes on to talk about the kinds of alternatives it will look, look at, including those that would minimize user conflicts. And lastly, in this um, problem statement, there was some question early on if the council was going to um, have specific measures for river herring and chat in this action, and instead um, it's explaining that any any kinds of measures that are developed to address user conflicts um, for Atlantic herring, in the analysis of those measures, we'll look and see what the impact could be on shad and river herring, but they're not specifically going to be designed around that. Council went on to say at the same meeting that they're going to look at more gears besides midwater, including persane, bottom trawl, and uh, the midwater trawl gear. And then most recently at our September council meeting, after a series of discussions, the council has now decided to call this new action amendment 10. Um, it's really it's to minimize user conflicts related to the Atlantic herring fishery. The council has tasked the Atlantic herring committee and the plan development team, which I chair the plan development team, to develop what's called a, a scoping document. And that's going to discuss the issues and the problems and look for feedback from the public. Um, the draft scoping document and the draft list of hearings will be discussed at the January council meeting. And our teams are working now to put all of that work together. Um, and last, the council also made a motion to um, explain more about um, what it would like to include in this action to address spatial and temporal allocation and management of Atlantic herring at the management unit level to minimize user conflicts, contribute to optimum yield and support rebuilding of the resource. Um, I just want to tell you about a few things about our webpage. So if you go to um, nefmc.org under management plans, you'll find Atlantic Herring. And there you'll have a brief overview of the plan and also some recent press releases that boils down this information into a couple pages. The first two are uh, relevant to both um, the Amendment 10 and also River Herring and Shad that you see on the um, bulleted under related news, press release and announcements. They're also uh, typed out here on the right for your reference. Also, if you look at the um, right hand column, there's these quick links and one of them at the very bottom you see says River Herring and Shad. And if you were to open that page up, um, you would see some links to our partners websites as well as a recent analysis from the plan development team on river herring and shad catch in the Atlantic herring fishery that was tasked to us to complete this year and it's available for folks to look at um, also on this page. And that concludes my updates. I can take any questions folks may have and appreciate the time to provide this today. Thanks for um, providing that update, Jamie. Uh, always appreciate you coming. Um, I guess I would ask if you could put those links in the chat, that would be super helpful. Um, and if folks have questions for James. Sure, I'll do that right now. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. It looks like James added some information about um, macro numbers. Any other hands for Jamie before we move on from the management update section into our technical presentations? I guess any questions for James, Jamie, uh, or Katie? Not seeing any. Obviously, want to give adequate time for folks to raise hands while, while we have the management folks here. Um, but with that, I, I think we're ready to move on. James, did you have anything to add? Uh, no, just the, in uh, response to uh, the question in the chat or in the questions box, I did put a link to the meeting report from the Mid-Atlantic Council's meeting that had a lot of information on the reduced, um, on the stock assessment numbers, as well as the, re the greatly reduced quota for Atlantic mackerel that led to the decision on river herring shad bycatch. There is a river herring shad bycatch section in that report as well, although it's not much more detailed information than already given. But um, yeah, if anybody would like to check out more information there, they can feel free to check that out. 
Yeah, and I'll make sure to hyperlink. We'll 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 make sure to get all these links um, out in the meeting summary email as well. Like we always try and do just so folks can kind of stay abreast of what's going on at the council level. Um, and I saw thanks Jamie for putting that in the chat. Appreciate that. We are running a minute ahead of schedule, which is great. Um, I think our our first presentation is um, Meghna Marjadi, um, who is now with uh, Noah Fisheries. And I had reached out to Meghna a while back to come present at the forum. Uh, she was wrapping up her dissertation at that time, but um, now reached out and said she had some capacity to present and, and appreciate that. Um, so, so with that, I think James, I'll make you a presenter and I'll meet you and if you want to. All right, great. Um, thanks so much for having me. So I um, am presenting on some of my dissertation work um, I'm in a new role now as a postdoc, but I'm talking a little bit about some work using multi-decadal data sets to evaluate trends in adult migration patterns and juvenile counts for blueback herring in the Connecticut River. And so um, everyone here is aware of some of the gaps in our understanding of river herring life history. I'm really focusing today on our gaps in understanding of the triggers of adult migrations and how those triggers might be influenced by environmental conditions as well as relationships between adult migration patterns and juvenile outcomes. So juvenile counts and survival and spawning outcomes. And in addition, juvenile counts over time in the Connecticut River. And so there's already some evidence in different systems that anadromous fishes are migrating earlier in relation to environmental conditions. Um, this study by Lombardo and colleagues in 2019 uh, demonstrated that there was a move forward in um, migration timing as well as shorter migration periods for alewife. There's been some other studies looking at earlier migrations for allosane species as well as shorter migrations. There haven't been any um, comprehensive studies on blueback herring and so that's kind of what I was looking at in this study. Uh, when you know alewife or blueback herring migrate earlier they might have um, a mismatch with their spawning resources, specifically the zooplankton that the fish might need to eat. And this could result in differences in how juveniles survive as well as spawning outcomes. That was something I really wanted to look at was connecting migration patterns and juvenile outcomes. And so this project was really looking to understand how these adult migration patterns were changing in the Connecticut River in relation to environmental conditions, as well as the juvenile counts and lengths. And we were only able to do this because there's an extensive long-term data set for Connecticut River migration patterns, as well as juvenile counts and lengths. And so I'll talk a little bit about more about those data sets in a little bit. But some potential triggers for adult migrations have included earlier adult migrations being related to changes in precipitation and discharge, seasonal transition dates, so later falls, uh, shorter winters and earlier spring transitions have been associated with earlier adult migrations in alewife, and different changes in stream temperatures, a little bit inconclusive, some sometimes higher stream temperatures are associated with early migrations and sometimes they're not, so that's a question. Um, large adult run sizes have been associated with earlier adult migrations, and also Gulf Stream Index, lower Gulf Stream Indexes have been associated with earlier adult migrations. For juvenile lengths and counts, there's evidence that higher precipitations and discharge have been associated with lower juvenile lengths and lower counts. Higher stream temperatures have been associated with lower uh, counts and lower lengths, and lower NAOI has been associated with lower counts and lower lengths. Additionally, lower adult counts and later adult migration have been associated with lower total counts of juveniles. So I wanted to look at how adult migration patterns have changed over the last 40 years in the Connecticut River in relation to environmental conditions, and additionally, how juvenile counts and lengths have changed in the last 40 years in relation to uh, environmental conditions and adult migration patterns. So looking at the Connecticut River watershed, which is the largest watershed in New England, we were really just looking at the lower portion of the watershed. So from Holyoke Dam to um, Long Island Sound. So it's about 115 to 130 kilometers. And using the data from the Holyoke fish lift to 
um, to assess the timing of migration for adult blueback herring. So anadromous blueback herring travel up the Kinetic River to the Holyoke Dam, where they are transported across the fish lift and enumerated and identified as they go over. Um, less than 1% of passing fish at this dam have been ill with, so passage data are really limited to blueback herring. They also enumerate shad and other species at this site, but we are really just looking at blueback herring. So adult passage has been recorded since from 1976 um, to today. We were just looking at 1976 to 2020 for this project, and um, it's recorded from April to July. And so here's some video of some shad passing through that fish lift. And so I was pairing that juvenile count and length data with an extensive SANE survey conducted by the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. So they conduct an annual SANE survey in the Connecticut River to monitor juvenile anadromous fishes. Um, this historical data was shared with us. So here's um, a picture of some of their SANEing. They have been SANEing weekly from 1979 to 2019. Um, and with juveniles from July to October, the total length has, was also recorded for a portion of these dates, 1996 to 2019, for individuals larger than 35 millimeters. They stand at seven different sites. The most northern three sites actually had really inconsistent levels of juveniles being collected. So for this study, we looked at the southern four sites to really have a better idea of what the patterns were over time. And then also collected a bunch of local environmental metrics to really understand the environmental conditions. So the top two um, little water faucets are USGS discharge gauges that we use to estimate flow. And the bottom uh, temperature gauges were also USGS gauges that had temperature associated with them for the period of time uh, of the study. We used these stream temperatures to calculate uh, seasonal transition dates, including fall transition and winter and spring. We also calculated temperature, water temperature at the migration start, peak, and, and during the summer, fall, winter, and spring. And we did that for both the juvenile lengths and counts to look at that as a comparative variable. So looking at our first research question, we constructed a number of general, generalized linear models to represent relationships between our input factors, including many variables, seasonal transition dates, stream temperatures, GSI, precipitation and discharge, adult run size, and AOI for a bunch of different seasonal components. We eliminated collinear variables and compared them to different components of the run. So the initiation date was the, when the first 5% of fish had passed upstream. The peak was the first 50% of fish and 95% of fish, and then the duration being the difference between the end and the initiation. And so we found that migrations had shifted earlier and become shorter since 1976. So on the x-axis here, you have the year, the y-axis has the day of the year, and um, the red is the end of the migration, the blue at the bottom is the beginning, and you can see that the end date is getting earlier, a little bit faster than the beginning date, and then as a result, the migration is getting a little shorter. And this is just showing the duration, showing the same trend, showing that as the year gets um, more recent, the migration duration is getting shorter um, with a, a fair bit of noise, but still a, a general trend. We also found that shorter winters were associated with earlier migrations. So you can see the winter duration on the x-axis here in an initiation day, peak day, and end date. Um, as the you know, winter duration is getting shorter, we are seeing that the initiation date is getting earlier. And this could be related to um, shorter winters being associated with higher sea surface temperatures. So a similar trend was shown for, by, for ale life, um, a study by Dalton et al. in 2022. And it could be possible that when the um, sea surface temperatures are higher, the ale life, or maybe the blueback herring in this case, are able to stay closer to shore during the winter, which allows them to migrate in sooner. 
And then also um, more winter precipitation was associated with later migrations. So higher precipitation in winter, especially in our study, could reflect more snowfall and increased snowpack, which when it melts in the spring could increase flow. These increased flows have been associated with spawning migrations in some anadromous species, though the trigger has been inconsistent. So I think more watersheds need to be considered to really understand if that's what's happening, especially in a large uh, river system like the Connecticut River, it may not have as much of an impact. Uh, we also found that higher water temperature was associated with the later migration starts and ends. And um, this was contrary to studies uh, in other systems. Uh, it's, it's unclear why a higher water temperatures would be associated with later migration starts. It could be a latitudinal pattern, but this is something that I'm still thinking about as to why this is happening uh, in the system. So then looking at juvenile counts and lengths, we were looking at similar predictor variables for this uh, metric. So stream temperatures, and then also the adult migration timing, the adult run size, the precipitation and discharge in nursery months, as well as during the previous year and the NAOI. And we are looking at two output variables, juvenile count and mean juvenile length. So overall, juvenile count did decrease during our study period. This is um, the juvenile count for each of the four different sites on the lower part of the river. And juvenile length varied by year, but there was no general trend. We found that higher water temperature predicted lower juvenile lengths and counts. So here you have September water temperature on the x-axis and the mean total length of juveniles. You can see that there's a decrease in lengths with higher temperatures and that um, higher, more summer water temperature variability was associated with higher juvenile counts. So there have been um, some relationships between water temperature and lower growth rates in alewife, not necessarily in blueback herring, and there's evidence in laboratory studies that exposure to higher temperatures and lower food rations could result in reduced growth for juvenile alewife. So potentially in September, if food resources have depleted, higher temperatures may have greater impacts on growth rates. The variability in water temperature could affect um, higher juvenile, could allow for higher juvenile counts by providing more of a reprieve for juveniles from really extended high water temperatures, which could reduce impact of heat exposure. Um, there's a little bit of noise there as well, so also unclear. And uh, finally, we found that longer adult migration predicted higher juvenile counts. And so this is the adult migration, migration duration on the x-axis and the juvenile counts on the y-axis. And the longer that adults were migrating, there were higher amounts of juveniles. And we wonder if this could be related to longer, um, longer migrations being associated with longer spawning durations or larger runs coming in during longer migration periods. And this has uh, some implications if migration periods are getting shorter over time. Does that have any implication for juvenile counts um, over time as well? So overall, um, we found that shifts to earlier and shorter migrations were associated with shorter winters, lower winter precipitation, and colder stream water temperatures. And that counts decreased and lengths varied for juvenile river herring, but did not decrease. And that adult migration times and summer water temperatures were associated and higher summer water temperatures were associated with uh, lower counts and lower juvenile lengths. And so a next step with this is this is a really um, rich data set to look at. We're working on getting this uh, work out into a publication as well. But thinking about using the same data set to evaluate similar trends for other species like American shad, because using these long-term data sets really allows a clearer uh, understanding of what kind of phenological impacts are happening. And so I'd like to thank all of the many funders on this project and uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife and CTD for sharing their data with us. And um, I will take questions. I think we have a bunch of time. So I I went through that a bit fast. I can go back to go through anything if needed.
Thanks, Magda. Yeah, you've got about five minutes, so um, yeah, plenty of time for questions. Yeah. Really interesting to look at um, long-term data sets like that. Uh, you, you did have, let's see, I see two questions in the chat, one from George Jackman and one from Eric Schultz. I, you guys are welcome to unmute and ask your question yourselves. We got two hands raised as well. Um, yeah. I'll, get, I'll give a second for George or Eric to raise their hands if they want to ask, otherwise I can read them. And um, oh, Eric can't get unmuted, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, I can't. Yeah, I can't. Oh, wait, I figured that. it out. <laughs> I figured it out. May I may I ask my question? Go ahead. Okay. Uh Magna, thank you. Um we as uh, has been the case for a while have a lot to talk about. I'm super interested in your analysis. Um I'm wondering so we we as as you may know have, have sampled uh below the Holyoke Dam for bluebacks um over the years and of course, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service have uh, ongoing monitoring data for the catches of blueback uh, uh, below the dam. And I'm wondering what, whether you've taken a look at, the, at, at that data set's view of phenology um, adult migration relative to what the Holyoke Dam says about it. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, so there is that electrofishing study that um, has been happening below the dam, and it's a shorter data set. I think that that's something that's kind of a, a potential next step and that I've talked about um, doing, um, but it hasn't been something that I've worked on yet. It's a really good question to see if it's reflected in that data set as well. Sorry, it's an unsatisfactory answer. <laughs> Not at all, thank you. <laughs> um, so George Jackman's questions, then we'll go to those raised hands. Um, asking about uh, sh linking shifts in phenology to fishery-induced evolution um, was the term he used um, as you know, driving, changing, maturation schedules, decreased total length, and other phenological changes, um, or also I had a follow-up question here, um, if, if the selection pressure, assuming of, of fishing, um, is driving, you know, the, uh, let's see, he can't get unmuted, but um, would tend to counter the largest weight mort mortality, I think it was. So, I don't know. Did you have any, um, Magna? Did you did you look at all at um, you know um, uh, correlating the, the, those counts with any of the um, the the information we have from their time at sea, you know, associated with fisheries dependent? Um, we did not. So we don't have. We also don't have like adult sizes or anything like that for this data set. So I think it's just it's mostly just timing. I there potentially could be um fisheries uh, related impacts on timing itself um maybe certain well that not necessarily fisheries but like dam, dam related impacts of certain things opening at different times but not really at in the connecticut river per se um that's not something we explored okay thanks i'll mm -hmm. go ahead and open it up to our raised hand folks. Um, i think kevin had his up first i can't tell if it's sorting alphabetically or by order. So go ahead. Um, I guess, James, if you don't meet Kevin, go ahead. Ask your question. Yep, I think I'm good. Am I good, Jenna? You're good. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome presentation. Really interesting stuff here. I just had one question from the, um, like the longer migration predicting more juveniles. Is there, did you look at all to see what, uh, how that was reflected in total passage number? Um, just with like the you know, mid 80s with 600,000 plus fish going through and then, you know, 2006, only 21 fish went through. I just wonder yeah. if there's anything that, yeah, maybe like having more fish means you'll have a longer drawn out migration time and then more That's juveniles as a result. Definitely a compounding factor, um, but we also didn't show that much of a, the, the relationship between total adult count and juvenile count was not significant in our model, which seems really odd. Um, so I think that um, 
there is definitely a connection between the size of the run and the migration, and that could be related to the juvenile counts as well. I think those, two, I think the two things are working together um, rather than one kind of out outplaying the other. Got it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And then our other raised hand was Wilson Laney or um, Roger, depending on who raised the hand there. So yeah, we're here. Uh, it was me. Jonathan, we, Roger and I were wondering, Magna, thanks for the presentation, really interesting. Um, with respect to you seeing, uh, if we were paying close enough attention here, smaller juveniles with the, the higher temperatures, do you speculate that that has something to do with higher energetic demand for the juveniles, the warmer the temperature is, or is there something that might be going on with the, with the prey base? Yeah, I wonder if it could be a combination of the two. So, um, so Leon Gua for her, oh, I can't get to go back. It's going to show um, with her work had showed in lab settings with Alewife that um, exposure to high temperatures and in the really and in addition low food rations was related to lower growth rates. So perhaps it is an energetic demand, um, especially because we saw the biggest effect of that in September when the juven when the zooplankton resources would presumably be lowest. But again, it's, an, it's in a, a non-lab setting, so it's not something we can tell for sure, but it is, it is something that I was wondering about and it was interesting to see that replicated a little bit. Um, so that's definitely an open question and maybe if somebody went back into the field setting and collected zooplankton at the same time, they'd be able to actually see if there was a connection. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that, yeah. that would be interesting to, uh, to have the uh, zooplankton data as well. All right, um, we had three more questions in the chat or in the question box here for you, Magnet, but okay. you know, in, the inter in the interest of staying on time here, because we're, uh, you thought you were gonna have an extra time at the end. <laughs> lots of questions, which is great. And we appreciate That's the good. presentation. Um, we can circle back around. I don't know if, if Megan, if you're on, you know, later on when we have just sort of the discussion, if there's time in, in that space, we can circle back to these questions. You're, and you're obviously um, welcome to respond, um, you know, through through the uh, questions, I don't know, app or feature on yeah. this um, I, meeting as well, if you want to follow okay. up with those folks. Sure. I can't actually see them in my screen, huh. but, okay. um, <laughs> but if you send them to me, I'll respond. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, thanks. Are, you able to, are you able to see the chat? I can see the chat, but I can't. The last question I can see is about Spanish mackerel. Oh, okay, interesting. Um, <laughs> all right, well, we'll uh, at the very we'll figure out a way to get them to you, and then. Okay, uh, sounds good. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much for your presentation. Yeah. Um, next up, we have uh, Cody Dillingham from University of Maine. He's going to be talking about passage of efficacy for alewife. Um, so James should make you a presenter and you should be able to share your screen and, and camera if you so choose, Cody. Uh, so hi everybody, my name is Cody. I'm a second year master's student at the University of Maine, looking to defend uh, in this coming spring, fingers crossed. Uh, and I'm here to talk to you about alewife passage at a state-of-the-art fishway. As you all will know, um, river herring populations are severely depleted when compared to their historic abundance. And one of the major drivers of this decline has been the widespread fragmentation of rivers by culverts, road crossings, and dams. And we can install fishways or fish bypasses to allow fish to uh, move over a dam as a way to mitigate the effects of fragmentation. Um, but not all fishways are created equal, and not all species pass a given fishway with the same efficiency. Typically, fishways are designed to pass salmonids, which is reflected in their passage success through all manners of fishways. And unfortunately, clipiformes like alewives and blueback herring are among those species most negatively affected by those salmon-centric fishways. The decline of river herring in Maine has spurred all uh, many kinds of conservation actions across the state. Uh, I'll be focusing on the Kennebec River for this talk, uh, where Maine's Department of Marine Resources and Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife have been managing river herring for the past few decades. River herring in the Kennebec River are primarily managed via stocking and harvest management, 
and to a lesser extent through dam removals and fishway construction. But that said, the Kennebec River gained fame in the 90s when, for the first time ever, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission forcibly decommissioned and removed the Edwards Dam, citing the dam's impacts on migratory fishes as a leading cause for removal. And since then, removals and bypasses have become a more staple method in Maine's river restoration work. And for the rest of my time today, I'm going to be talking about a bypass that was recently installed at the Togas Pond Dam, about 10 minutes to the east of Edwards Dam. Um, the Togas Pond is uh, roughly three square kilometers and drains into the Togas Stream and then into the Kennebec River after about a 10 kilometer journey. I'll give you a brief history of, of the site and the work that's going on there. Uh, the dam at Togas Pond was installed in 1804 and there was no form of fish passage. And so the dam separated river herring from their ancestral habitat and extirpated them from the system. Alewives had been the most abundant diagenous species in the system, um, and their absence was sorely felt in the light of lucrative alewife fisheries elsewhere in the state. So when restoration efforts began in Togus Stream, alewives were the first target species. Fast forward now to 2010, um, to reintroduce alewives to the system, Maine's Department of Marine Resources began stocking fish into Togus Pond. And then in 2014, they began netting these fish over the dam by hand to facilitate migration in the absence of a proper fishway. They did this for six full years until a fishway was finally installed in 2020. Um, but the, uh, the Togus Pond fishway wasn't going to be just some fishway, uh, it was going to be uh, state of the art. It was designed by US Fish and Wildlife Service engineers specifically to accommodate alewife migrations, and it was built to standards beyond the minimum recommendations for alewife passage set forth by the Fish and Wildlife Service. So indeed, the Togus Pond Fishway was intended to be state of the art and its effectiveness would be uh, stand as testament to our best available knowledge in designing fishways for alewives. There were many intentional design decisions that sought to accommodate alewives. Uh, I'll just list here uh, a few of them. Uh, in short, the Togus Pond Fishway has pools that are deeper, wider, and longer than standard. Uh, and these specifications aim to make the fishway more passable and increase the number of fish that can use the fishway at the same time. There's many more accommodations than this that were present in the design, um, but, but this is a brief overview. So once the fishway was finished, the next step was to figure out how effective it was. The most basic way to describe effectiveness is by tagging some fish and seeing what proportion of those fish make it into the pond which is the overall passage efficiency of the structure. Um, but we also wanted to go a little bit further with our assessment to characterize movements within the fishway. By tracking fine scale movements, we would be able to discern if there was fallback or delay happening within the fishway, not just through the fishway overall. So to do this, we conducted a pit telemetry study through this most recent summer. Um, we use Oregon RFID readers and Barmark uh, 12 millimeter half duplex pit tags uh, for the study and we built our own antennas, which was probably the hardest part of the whole operation. These things are basically a giant electromagnet uh, that resonates at a particular frequency and it turns out that it's pretty hard to get them to do that in the way that you want. Um, the Mark 1 antenna uh, was intended to span the width of the fishway, but we couldn't get it to tune very well. Um, and there was this large dead spot through the majority of that uh, center area. Uh, so we moved to a smaller intended design that would encompass only the weirs in the fishway. Um, unfortunately, we still couldn't get this smaller antenna to work. Uh, so we had to go back to the drawing board to come up with a new plan. And we ended up losing the entire 2022 field season to this. Uh, so we knew we had to get it right for the 2023 season. Uh, in 2023, we came back with a brand new, uh, refresh out of the box, half duplex system, and we stuck with the smaller antenna design for our final version. I certainly learned a lot more about electrical engineering in this process than I ever intended to, um, 
and uh, that said, I did come out of it feeling a little bit like Iron Man, so it's uh, not so bad after all. Um, but anyway, our final design for the antennas was this 46 by 76 antenna, uh, 46 by 76 centimeter antenna. Uh, the antenna had six wraps of multi-strand 12 gauge wire and an auto tuning accessory computer uh, to help uh, communicate with the, the uh, main computer. We ended up using four of these antennas for the study. Um, the antennas at the first and last weirs were the ones used to describe overall passage efficiency, and the two antennas within the fishway described the internal movements. These antennas were mounted to the downstream faces of the weir, so being detected at a weir indicated presence in the pool below it. So um, detection at weir 10 indicates presence in the 180 degree turn pool uh, and, and so on. We used a purse seine to catch our fish and we injected our tags uh, under the skin uh, by the dorsal fin. Um, we ended up catching 743 fish in total, 394 from within the fishway and 349 from the stream. We did this for a couple of reasons. Uh, we wanted to sample some of the fish that we knew had some experience with the fishway to see if their passage was different from those without you know, confirmed experience. Um, but also on some days, we just couldn't find any fish in the stream. So our options were limited. So uh, fortunately that ended up being roughly 50-50, uh, which we're pretty happy with. Our tagging this year uh, occurred uh, in both May and June. Um, we had started out by assuming that all of the fish were alewives since that was what had been stocked into the pond by DMR. Um, but of course we did end up finding some bluebacks eventually. Uh, so we decided to call all fish tagged before that point a generic like river herring and the rest were identified to species before tagging. That said, even when we were looking for bluebacks, they made up less than 10% of our total sample size. So it seems likely that the majority of those unidentified fish were also alewives. Um, but since we don't have a confirmed ID on them, we're treating them as a separate species for the time being. By May 22nd, we were capturing fewer than 10 fish a day, so we stopped sampling so I could focus on another study that I was running concurrently to this one, uh, which was fun to juggle. Um, we returned to Togus in the week of June 12th to attempt to describe the late running fish, um, but there really weren't many fish around. We tagged all 17 fish that we found on that Wednesday, but um, at that point it was pretty clear that the one was over, so we stopped sampling altogether. So we're still working through the analysis for this study. Uh, so you know, I've, I've got some results to share with you that are preliminary. Um, so I wanna run through those real quick, but just wanted to note there that they are preliminary results for now. Here's a quick graphic that shows the size distributions for each species. Um, the sizes of the river herring and the alewives were nearly identical, uh, around 21 and a half centimeters for both. And then the bluebacks were a little bit smaller than that, which is of course what we would expect. Um, and I have some graphics here to visualize some of the type of movements that we saw within the fishway. Uh, I'll use this nice clean example to demonstrate um, what we're looking at, but then I'll get into some more complex uh, examples afterwards. So basically, a fish that's detected at weir one is currently at the downstream entrance of the fishway. Then as the fish moves up the fishway, it gets detected on those upper antennas uh, until it is eventually detected at weir 17. And at this point, we say it is successfully past the fishway. Unfortunately, linear movements like this were not the norm, um, and many fish experienced delays in their movement, uh, particularly while navigating the turn pools. And the 180 degree turn pool seemed to have caused much more delay than the 90 degree turn pool. In some cases, fish would fall back to the 90 degree turn pool, uh, presumably to regain their strength to attempt to ascend through pool 10. Uh, and in many cases, the turn pulls completely overwhelmed the fish and prevented passage altogether. I also wanna note the x-axis here uh, that show that there's a lot of variability between these passage experiences. Um, time spent in, in each section of the fishway is variable. Some fish were delayed for minutes 
uh, in these turn pools. Some are delayed for hours. Um, and so we don't really have the metrics yet for how frequently fallback or delay occurred or to what extent this is pass, uh, affecting passage. But just by skimming through the graphs, sort of visually, I can say that both fallback and delay were quite common uh, in these fish. So um, here we have the cumulative passage track, uh, which is the uh, proportion of fish that pass each checkpoint in the fishway. Um, of the fish that pass through one, how many pass through four? Of the ones that pass through four, how many pass through 10, and so on. When we look at it, we see uh, this drop off in passage at full 10, uh, the 180 degree turn. And uh, though passage through the other reaches is quite high, the 180 degree turn pool has such low passage that it brings the overall passage efficiency for all fish in aggregate to 56%. And when we break that down further by species, it seems that blueback herring have especially poor passage. We also see that the generic river herring have a much higher passage uh, proportion than the identified fish. Um, but uh, just remember that the river herring were those fish tagged earliest in the season. So it's likely that there's some temporal factor influence pa uh, influencing passage here that isn't described by simple proportions. Um, but we will be looking to characterize that further as the analysis continues. So we're looking forward to continuing our analysis of these data in the coming months, where we'll be modeling the data using the Castro Santos and Perry time to event framework, uh, which is a form of survival analysis that models passage, passage success with uh, covariates like water temperature, velocity, and fish length. Uh, and that will allow us to discern which factors had the biggest impact on fish passage. Um, so I do wanna make a couple sort of closing remarks here. Um, what can we say about the state of the art and is it good enough for alewives? Um, well, the spe alewife specific passage effectiveness was about 48% for now only looking at those alewives that were confirmed to be alewives or those river herring that were confirmed to be alewives. And uh, when we compare that to uh, other fishways, we can see that alewives at Togus have higher passage success than, than those in other fishways overall. Togus Fishway had uh, more than double the average passage efficiency for Cluperformes overall and was competitive or even a little bit better than other pool and weir fishways for non salmonids So while 48% isn't exactly pretty, it's a bit better than average. Um, but that said, we also have seen alewives have more success than this in some other fishways. So it is a bit of a mixed bag, but uh, a bit of a positive note there. Um, I'm going to try to wrap up quickly here. Sorry about the timing. Um, the uh, population is also increasing, even with the 48% passage success um, over the past two years, or at least 2020 and 2021. The uh, population increased from 30,000 to 70,000. Um, so there is some population growth, even with this uh, level of passage success. Um, the counter wasn't run in 2022, 2023, so I'm not sure what they were doing then. but. Um, I also do want to note real quick that the, um, the Togus fishway was built to surpass the current recommendations for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So presumably if another fishway was built following only the minimum recommendations, uh, that fishway would likely perform more poorly than Togus did. But that said, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service will be updating the recommendations in the coming years and the uh, results from this study will directly inform those updated design criteria. So. Um, we'll be publishing the re final results from this study next year, shortly after I defend in the spring. Um, and so the publication should follow shortly thereafter. So that's all I have for today. I want to say thank you to the folks that helped me get the project done. Thank you to Maine DMR, the Nature Conservancy, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for uh, providing the funding. And thank you all for listening to my talk. If we can spare a couple minutes, I'll answer questions. But otherwise, feel free to email me and reach out later. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thanks, Cody. Um, certainly, I think I'm sure many of the folks on the call here can um, sympathize with the challenges of getting a study off the ground, uh, especially when you're dealing with electronics. So um, I think, you know, a lot of us have been there. Um, we have, you know, maybe a minute or two. We can take, I'll say, one question. So whoever's quickest on the hand raise can 
ask their question if they have a burning one. Um, otherwise, if folks enter it into the questions box, we will work to get that over to Cody. Um, Oops. Oh, yeah, we got uh, Wilson. Wilson has his hand up, so go ahead. Okay, it's, it's Roger this time. <laughs> hi, Eric. Hi, everybody. Um, I was curious, Cody, whether you um, looked at fish length as a function or if success as a function of fish length for, for the two species. Right. So, no, I haven't yet. That is definitely on our list. That, that's one of the first things I want to look at uh, as the analysis kind of develops. Um, that, that's definitely going to be one of the things that we include as a, a covariate in our survival analysis, um, because we do think it plays a very large factor. Um, uh, so yeah, we, will, we will be looking at that, but we haven't yet. Thank you. Yeah, I would also think like, so I assume that the MDMR fish counter has daily uh, or does it have hourly numbers? Are you able to, you know, look at passing success, you know, as a function of how many, you know, how many are in the fish way at a time, that kind of thing? Yeah, I I right now have, uh, I only have the annual counts. I know, I know we have the, the more daily counts available, um, um, but I'm, I'm not sure how we want to approach that for where the trap count um, information is from previous years uh, versus uh, we don't have that uh, sort of census from this year. Um, but uh, that is something that, that we can likely uh, look at if, um, if we choose to, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, good luck. Um, yeah, really digging into your analyses here. I assume that'll be a big part of your winter um, and appreciate you coming on to share some of your um, initial thoughts. I, I did see one message in here from Jeremy McCargo. I will assign that to you and you should be able to see it once I assign it to you, Cody, and you can you should be able to answer it. So um, I'll uh, I'll pass that over to you offline and then um, we'll go ahead and switch on over to um, our next speaker, who's Chelsea Fowler. So thanks for coming, Cody. All right. Thank you, guys. Hello, I'm Chelsea Fowler. I'm a graduate student at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. And today I'm going to be talking about my recently completed master's work where I evaluated the capacity for eDNA monitoring to work as a fish enumeration tool for river herring. So uh, just as an overview of environmental DNA or eDNA, all organisms expel DNA into their environment, uh, after which it remains in the environment for a short period of time. eDNA monitoring is based on the premise that we can collect and detect eDNA using highly sensitive genomic tools. And since it decays uh, quite quickly in the environment, we can uncover highly localized information. So species-specific eDNA tools, which are the tools I'm going to be talking about today, use uh, species-specific markers to determine if a species is present or absent from a system. And two species for which these sorts of assays already exist and have been validated are for river herring. So these species need no introduction here. I'm focused on the mid-Atlantic stock as our, our research site was on the Choptank River of the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, the mid-Atlantic stock migrates into fresh water in the early spring, and tools typically used to assess their populations include fike netting, electrofishing, visual counting. These methods can be labor and resource intensive, especially when trying to sample over a large spatial area on these relatively small populations. And this is why newer, more passive methodologies are attractive options for the management of these species. So while eDNA tools for these species are relatively new, sonar devices have been used to monitor river herring in shallow river systems since 2012, and they can generate fish count estimates as seen here on the left. Uh, you can see their patterns of abundance during the spawning season as captured by one of these devices. So these devices don't require any physical interaction with the fish. However, the videos like the one here need to be watched and counted by a trained observer. 
Additionally, uh, since our two species are very similar in size, this means that additional biological sampling like electrofishing needs to be conducted in order to generate species specific counts. And this is where eDNA uh, can come in. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, a river herring eDNA assay has already been designed and was used in 2018 alongside ichthyoplankton sampling and visual counts of adult fish. And in this case, the assay was able to uncover some interesting spatial and temporal patterns, but it only provided measures of presence and absence or relative abundance, which you can see here as copy numbers which brings me to my work. Uh, you could click forward. Examining if eDNA sampling can generate predictions of absolute fish abundance. Next slide, please. So to do this, we launched both a sonar device and an automatic water sampling device at a site on the Chop Tank River for the 2021 river herring spawning season. This was strategically located downstream from a USGS gauge as stream discharge has been documented to have a dilution effect on eDNA detection probability and uh, may act as a migration trigger for river herring. Both devices were launched from March to May to coincide with the known spawning season for these species in this area. Next slide. So pictured here, you can see our uh, sonar device, the dual frequency identification sonar. All of this work was conducted by the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. So this device uses a total expected length, which for river herring is between 200 and 350 millimeters. As I mentioned earlier, this device can't differentiate between our two species. So weekly electrofishing was conducted uh, in order to generate species proportions. Next slide. eDNA was collected by sampling the water once a day. So pictured here is an automatic sampling device that collects uh, 900 milliliters of water per draw. This device holds 24 bottles, so collection of the water samples every day wasn't necessary. eDNA is highly degraded though, so to preserve our eDNA between the time of collection and the time of filtration, a preservative was loaded into the bottles. Uh, so these bottles sat in the device for between one to seven days. We conducted some independent decay experiments to see if there was uh, decay taking place between the time of collection and the time of filtration. But given our uh, environmental conditions, we did not uncover any strong patterns of decay. So this is how our devices were situated on the bank of the Chop Tank River. The Didson device is submerged in the water and the automatic water sampler is on the shore with the strainer secured underwater. The fish are swimming back and forth in front of these machines as they migrate upstream and back downstream. And these devices collect information at different intervals. So the Didson device takes a video for 10 minutes every hour. These videos are watched by a technician who counts the fish moving in either direction. And this count is multiplied by six to reflect an estimated hourly count. These hourly counts are then summed to generate a daily count. The automatic water sampling device collected two samples once a day at 6 p.m. to coincide with the peak activity hours for these species. So to the right, you can see the interior of the device. The device was programmed to take three draws of water every day at 6 p.m. So the water is drawn up through the strainer and it's deposited into the bottles. The red capped bottle is denoting that that's a wash bottle, so that was to uh, prevent contamination between sampling events and the subsequent two in green uh, were used for our analysis. So this occurred every day and once a week the bottles were exchanged out for new bottles. So as I uh, mentioned earlier, the eDNA tool we used here was developed uh, in the Plow et al. 2018 paper, which you can find by following this QR code. Briefly, uh, the samples were filtered and the eDNA was extracted using a CTAB method. We uh, quantified the amount of eDNA in the sample using a qPCR device and a dual species molecular beacon assay. So this uh, assay 
can't differentiate between our two species, but we're able to send out positive detections for additional sequencing and we can generate species specific proportions that way. Finally, we collected various environmental variables known to be associated with river herring migration and eDNA persistence, detectability, and transport. So our water temperature was collected by our Didson device, stream discharge was from the USGS gauge I mentioned, and milling activity was a binary factor based on the observer notes. So a milling note indicated a period of increased fish activity when it can be difficult to properly quantify uh, the fish moving upstream and versus downstream just because of the sheer volume and uh, behavior. So uh, flip to the next slide and we can get into some results. So here's a look at our two data sets side by side. Our yellow bars are eDNA and the green line is our fish count. The fish count here is a summation of hourly counts 12 hours before the sampling event and 12 hours after the sampling event. I do want to address the gap in the data set from March 19th to the 29th, and this was due to device removal uh, during a high flow event. So these data sets are highly correlated with a Spearman correlation coefficient of 0 0.84. And this relationship was used to inform a model that sought to generate a predicted fish count using eDNA concentration. So uh, I broke how we created this model down into a few steps. We used a generalized additive model for location, scale, and shape. This had a lot of flexibility and we could use a wide array of distributions. For our response variable, which in this case was upstream fish count, we used a negative binomial distribution. We then first optimized the model for the main effect of eDNA on upstream fish count and found that a log transformed and flow corrected eDNA uh, was the best main effect for our model. Then we used forward and backward stepwise selection to add and remove environmental covariates to arrive at our final model. Next slide. So here's a look at our model of the covariate and interaction terms added and removed. The best fit included our flow corrected eDNA, milling, water temperature, Julian day, which is our day within the season, and two interaction terms uh, between eDNA and water temperature and water temperature and Julian day. Uh, this model had a strong fit with a mean absolute error of just below 3,000 fish and explained 88% of the variance. Another way to look at this data is over the spawning season. So here you can see uh, the, how it compares to our observed counts over the spawning season. So our black dots are observed counts and the line is our model prediction with a 95% confidence interval. Uh, we also, I also have the total run counts generated by the device and by the Didson device and by our model and they have a difference of just under 4,000 fish. I also generated species specific counts. As I mentioned earlier, electrofishing was conducted once a week while eDNA species proportions were collected every day. Uh, the eDNA species proportions were highly correlated with the electrofishing proportions. And since those eDNA proportions are generated at a finer time scale, I use those to generate species specific model predictions. Uh, you can click forward. So here we can see the species specific timing uh, of their presence in the system. We have alewife entering into the system earlier and our blueback herring uh, entering a bit later. So this model used all of our data points to both create the model and generate predictions, but we also wanted to evaluate how much fish count data was needed to inform our model. I did this by separating our data into training sets and test sets. So here I, uh, random, I grouped the data by week and randomly selected uh, weeks of data to be included in our training set. And you can see as we add uh, info as we add data to our training set, it becomes better at predicting our test set. I also uh, performed a learning curve, which randomized the sample selection. And I 
uh, tested sample sizes from one all the way up to uh, 69, which was our full data set. And you can see uh, as we, again, add data to the model, it becomes better, uh, becomes more close to the full model, which the average mean average error is that red dotted line across, uh, across the plot. So to kind of uh, summarize some of our big outcomes from the study was that eDNA can make predictions on fish abundance. These data sets were highly correlated and including those environmental covariates was really integral to the functionality of the model. So uh, recording dits in fish counts every day may not be necessary. Some subsetting of the data set showed that redu some reduced data sets could still generate production uh, generate predictions similar to the full model. And so some future outlooks for this sort of work would be to conduct a similar high frequency study, but at multiple locations along one stream. So the X here is our study site, and then the dots throughout the uh, rest of the river are just hypothetical fine scale sampling sites. Uh, which would help us better understand some of the degradation and transport taking place in the natural environment. But you could also imagine scaling this up. So this is a figure from that Plow et al. study again, and this is just all of their sampling locations. So you could imagine using the uh, sampling setup that we had here at locations uh, across a larger larger spatial scale, which again would help us uh, better understand how to address those site-specific characteristics and uh, gather more data on the river herring in this area. Next slide. And with that, I can take some questions. I will be uh, publishing this work soon. Uh, you can follow that QR code to the different ways to contact me and uh, yeah, I'll take any questions. Thanks so much, Chelsea. Um, very interesting results there. And, and I think, you know, there's been some real strides made in eDNA in the, in the last you know, couple of years. So um, I think it's really promising. Um, if folks have uh, questions, please feel free to raise your hand. Uh, maybe no surprise, uh, Wilson Laney has his hand raised. So go ahead, Wilson. It's, it's Roger again. <laughs> yeah, it's me. Uh, Chelsea, thanks for, for this. This is really interesting. Can you go back about four slides, please, um, to your showing the uh, positive correlation between one more, uh, yeah, this one, um, between fish abundance and eDNA abundance. Um, so, this is this is good. This is really good. Now, can can you actually translate this into uh, counts, or does this have to be something more general, like small, medium, large, or or, or something like that? Can can we actually get closer to a relative abundance? Yeah, so actually uh, this figure here is the model generated prediction. So my model took uh, an eDNA concentration and those other environmental covariates I mentioned, and mm -hmm. it uh, made them into upstream estimates of upstream count. So I think the figure the figure, the one with the bars was where I was just comparing the eDNA concentrations and the fish counts. This one mm -hmm. is uh, model predictions. Okay. So trying to make that step to generating absolute abundance using eDNA. Yeah. So could we take these numbers then and say, um, for management purposes, we need to ensure that there are going to be 20,000 fish in the system this year, could, could we then monitor eDNA to get an estimate of the number of fish and then uh, either below, at, or above uh, some kind of a stable, uh, or a, not a stable, but a sustainable, sustainable um, fishery? I think that would be the goal behind uh, doing 
something something like this, I would say it is very site specific. So due to you know having to include all those environmental covariates for the site that we used on the Chop Tank River, uh, it could potentially, you know, should should we conduct this study again and it has a similar result, uh, we would be able to do that. But I think upscaling it to other river systems, you would first need to conduct a study where you evaluate uh, the suitability of that site for eDNA sampling. Uh, eDNA is really subject to those environmental conditions. And so, uh, this was a relatively narrow point of the river and it was relatively shallow. So I, I think that's kind of the uh, future outlook for eDNA data. Hopefully, you know, if we have sites that have this strong relationship between a metric relevant abundance like fish count and eDNA data, then, you know, the hope is that you could use eDNA data to uh, get at some of this information. But I think you would first need to evaluate the site and the relationship that was that was present there. Yes, that, yeah, exactly. And um, one last question, did you, um, was there any salinity in the watershed? Uh, this is, it's above the tidal influence, so there may be uh, slight salinity, but we didn't, we didn't use that in any of our models, uh, and it wasn't okay. something we were concerned about. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, these are really interesting results, Chelsea, and I, um, put there was one more question we had for you. I put it in the chat if you just want to respond a little bit. Okay, behind. great. Yeah, I saw um, we can always circle back. We can always circle back. Move on to our final technical presentation from Alan Weaver. Um, so thanks so much, Chelsea. That was a great presentation, really interesting results. Yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our herring monitoring project at the Walker's Dam, Double Demille Fishway on the Chickahominy River. In Virginia, this is approximately River Mile 25. It is tidal right up to the dam. The dam failed in about 2015. There used to be a double Danil fishway in the middle of the river, and you can see the fishway over here, uh, right next to the new boat lock on the uh, river left side of the dam. So our goal with this project is to establish a herring run count for alewife and blueback herring in the Chickahominy at this fishway to inform population estimates not only for internal use, but also uh, in the region in Chesapeake Bay and also for Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. The objectives were to evaluate the accuracy of our spit root counter, generate percent composition estimates of species passing to apply to our run count. The reason we need to do that is because we have this other clupea known as a gizzard shad that is very abundant in the Chickahominy River. And so we have to tease out the alewife and blueback counts. And then there's some other species as well. Another objective is to generate annual run counts for target species, and then to track the herring population trends. So here's the fishway. This is a very short fishway. The, the difference between head pond and tailwater at low tides about three to three and a half feet. Uh, there are times when fish absolutely cannot swim over the dam, and so the only way upstream is through the fishway. This is a water supply, one of many water supply reservoirs. It does not really a reservoir, it's just a, they have enough depth to get have an intake for the city of Newport News. This was built uh, a couple years ago and during the conceptual design phase, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service engineer, Dick Quinn, who before he retired, we worked with the city and the consultant to, to come up with this design. So we'd have uh, two channels, one that would, perform best at high tide and one that would perform best at low tide. This is because they didn't really have time to go out and change stop logs all the time to, to match the, uh, to, you know, make sure there was a good attraction flow. So obviously at high tide, they're both available, but the high tide attraction flows set a little better at high tide, if you get, if you get the gist there. These are our homemade uh, counter tunnel arrays uh, using uh, five inch PVC. Again, because we have gizzard chad, a lot of the Northeast counters, they use four inch for herring, but because we have those larger gizzard chad, we had to use the, the larger tunnels. I got a lot of my information on how to build these from Dave Ellis with Connecticut DEEP. 
I was like, thankful for that. I learned about uh, them doing their hair counts at a data work, hearing data workshop uh, almost, almost 10 years ago. Uh, the, the tunnels have three equally spaced electrodes made out of just stainless steel uh, hose clamps, and they're wired using uh, data shielded wire so that the shielded wire made a big difference for us uh, in, our, in our situation. And basically, as the fish come through the last set of baffles on the Danil fishway, they have to swim through the tunnel. We uh, set the sensitivity of the counter based on the conductivity and the size of the fish. The higher the sensitivity, it'll pick up smaller fish, but we, we kind of dial it in at the beginning of the season and kind of have a good idea of how not to count the really small fish. Uh, we don't use solar anymore. Newport News was able to put up, uh, uh, give us an outlet uh, for uh, power, which is nice, uh, constant power, not having to worry about solar to, to get our power for our system. And uh, about this, Third year in, we, we built this hut that's waterproof and lightproof. And the reason for that is in order to get a timestamp on our data, we needed a way to, um, we, we couldn't get that from Smith Root. They, they could have put a, a, a data logger on there, but it would only cover half of the 16 channels. And then it would also uh, only record one event per second. And we sometimes can have, the counter can work up to nine fish passing per second. So this also helps us a lot when we're trapping because we just time sync with real time. And when we're doing our trapping, five, 10, 20 minute trapping sessions, we can go back and get our numbers, which is, which is very convenient. Here's our trapping operation. Uh, sometimes we have simultaneous trapping going on with, with both uh, exit channels being uh, trapping taking place. We're using a three quarter inch mesh net and we'll do this roughly every third day of the of the spring season. And again, I mentioned we have the two river herring species and the gizzard shad, and those gizzard shad tend to be a little bit deeper bodied and sometimes um, get close to getting stuck in the counter tunnels, but we haven't ever seen a gizzard shad get completely stuck, but close to it. So the data processing, we get the, we take the daily count total at the end of each day from the video. We enter the trap data by date, the trap event duration, the total number of fish and the, the number by species. And then we get the counter data for, for the, the total trapping event. Then we weight those trapping events because sometimes we'll trap for 10 minutes, sometimes we'll trap for 20 minutes, sometimes it's 15. And sometimes it's four or five trapping sessions a day, sometimes it's more than that. So we needed to put a, a weighting mechanism on the trapping data to, to best represent how the, those numbers affect the overall day and any expansion we might do. Then we're able to get the daily species present composition. And again, it's mostly gizzard shad and, and one of the herring, but we'll, we'll get other species as well, which I'll show in some upcoming slides. Then we apply that species percent composition to the daily counts to get the seasonal total. And so basically, obviously you get the day of trapping and then you apply those, those percentages to the days either side of trapping. If you have multiple days in between trapping events, then you're applying those numbers across a, a, a broader time frame. but it's usually within every, every couple of days that we're, we're trapping. Then we run some paired t-tests to check for any significant difference between our trap and our count data. And then further do some regression analysis in R, or I should say my assistant, my former assistant fish passage biologist did this in R and evaluated the overall count confidence and species count confidence. So just to give you an example of some of the results we're getting, uh, this is uh, 2021 showing the, the alewife, blueback and gizzard shad run, sort of the timing of their runs. And just, you know, notice that the the alewife run kind of all happened at once. We might have missed some in, in February uh, that we didn't capture. And notice the y-axis is about 10,000. And the gizzard shad and blueback herring was kind of a protracted run over April and May. But then, for example, sometimes the runs are much more concentrated by species. You can see here where the blueback herring run, pretty much all of it happened in April. And we had some, some really strong pulses right there in the middle of April and notice the y-axis, now it's up to 50,000. So um, 
you know, this time we were able to get out there early enough and get our alewife in in uh, in um, February. Then looking at the, this is an example from 2022, looking at the trapping events across the bottom and the total number of fish counted and the electronic method and the trap method. And if you notice, sometimes when we have a high uh, rate, a, a strong pulse of say blueback herring, the, the counter will underestimate the total count. And, but for the most part, it pretty much tracks and there's no uh, significant difference, which is a good thing. It means the counter is giving us good data. Then the further analysis to compare the counter accuracy, the number of fish trapped per minute versus the, the electronic counter over the course of the, of the uh, all the seasonal data put into this, we have a very high R squared with a very strong probability that this is not just random, that this is, it actually is counting the fish very accurately. And then we can also look at the, uh, by the, the confidence of estimating each migratory species, in this case, alewife, blueback, and gizzard shad. And you'll notice that the, that the herring and alewife, that just the numbers are, there's more of those fish sometimes. Uh, and that's why the, uh, the, uh, the rate of passage is higher than for the gizzard shad. There, there's, we, we'll, we'll see a lot of gizzard shad, uh, but per trap, uh, sometimes there's just, there's just less of them because they're larger fish. But here again, the, uh, we have a strong confidence in the estimates for the migratory species. And then just to get into some of the results over the five years of data that we have completed. Uh, in the first year, we had almost uh, half a million fish passed, dominated by gizzard shad, and pretty good numbers of blueback herring and alewife both, and then small percentage of other species. In this case, we did see some hickory shad going through the fishway. 2019, uh, the numbers dropped and they stayed down for a couple years, uh, but the the general percent composition pretty much stayed the same through 2019, and then also in 2020, not a not a real big shift in the overall percent composition. Very similar results, and you can see where we had some other additional species that we that we were able to trap to show that they were going through the fishway. Gar, um, the semi anadromous yellow perch, I guess you could call them semi anadromous. Uh, we also deal with threadfin shad on occasion at this site. And then 2021, we had our lowest number of fish. Uh, we still had a dominant, still dominated by a gizzard shad. And you can see we added a few more different species like uh, shorthead red horse. Then uh, 2022 numbers went back up a little bit, and this was the first time that we had the herring uh, percent composition dominate the gizzard shad. So we had more river herring, uh, and in, uh, individually we had more blueback herring than gizzard shad. We did see some American shad passing in 2022 for for one weekend. So we had not a real high confidence on the total estimate for American shad with a really low uh, set of samples for that one weekend but we did see some American shad. And then this is just a look at the trend from 2018 through 2022. Uh, you can see sort of a decline in the overall numbers, but in 2023, we haven't processed the numbers yet. We did have uh, over 300,000 total fish passed. So we will see an increase in the total number of fish and we haven't processed the, all the numbers yet, but the but the percentages, I think that the blueback herring and alewife will be a little bit higher percentage than gizzard shad, but we'll see how it all comes out once we run the run the analysis on the numbers. And so the total for the first five years is about 1.4 million fish. So if you add this year's, it's been almost close to 2 million fish passed through the fishway that we've counted at the fishway in the first uh, six years. VIMS is also doing, Virginia Institute of Marine Science, they're also doing some uh, gillnet uh, sampling downstream. And Pat McGrath, uh, who I believe is still on the call, uh, he has shared his, his data with us. And we see that our estimates at the Walker's Fishway, in terms of total numbers, tracks really well with what they're finding downstream. I don't have a good explanation for the difference in alewife being more abundant. Uh, 
maybe maybe it's because they're further downstream they're not moving upstream as far i'm not really sure on that we'll we'll have to we'll have to talk with vims about that but but the general point here is that our cpue in terms of total number of, of these different species of fish passing tracks very well with vims catch per unit effort then going forward we plan to get our counter out there in uh, february again early february we do need to do some more trapping during low or no light hours when we look back at our video of all of our uh, count data from from the dvr we see that sometimes there's some pulses in the early evening when we're not out there trapping we don't see a lot of fish passing through the middle of the night but we do see some hours that what we need to try to capture and there's a possibility of us using video to gather more species composition data so that we could you know record the whole season to a dvr and then subsample that video to get our sort of a surrogate for the trapping to try to eliminate the, the number of hours we need to be out there trapping and then we also uh, have been collecting head pond and tailwater temperature and depth data for some further analysis for their for the migration timing and determine the frequency of adequate submergence flow for spillway passage and what i mean by that is sometimes the river is actually that high it's a high enough tide that the fish can actually swim over the dam and then we did submit our first five years of, of count data to ASFMC for the benchmark river herring stock assessment. I don't know if that will be used yet or not. We're, we're hoping it gets used since we don't really have anything else like this, this kind of a herring count in the mid-Atlantic, at, uh, at least certainly not from Virginia. And then this is just a look at what I was talking about. You see the dam level, the lake level, and the tidal cycle. And you can see where sometimes there's enough submergence flow. It's some, where, where it exceeds it, it's obvious fish can swim over the dam. And if you notice, sometimes the river is actually flowing upstream. But there are, and this is just an example from 2019. It just depends on tide and flow. But most of the time, the only way upstream is through the fishway. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thanks, Alan. Uh, Wilson, is the relic tan or is it a, a fresh one? No, no, it's fresh. Um, thanks, Alan. <laughs> Great presentation. And uh, the question is, does your, this is a really intriguing little tunnel counter that you've got uh, in place there. Is that something that it, it is the water clarity a factor in the ability of that equipment to count the fish? Would, would it require really, really clear water? Or is it something that you think would work under more turbid conditions as well? It, it, it doesn't, the turbidity doesn't really matter because it's, it's the conductivity that matters more than the turbidity. Now, with turbidity, that might change your conductivity. So, uh, so in this case, the Chickahominy Lake, the Chickahominy Lake, is never muddy. I mean, it's it's sometimes tannic stained. Uh, so I don't really, I I can't really answer that question. Maybe you know, someone from New England that's used some counters may have something more to say about the the uh, turbidity because. In this case, we have we don't ever deal with turbidity. It could be up here where I live in the watershed in the Chickahominy, the, the creeks and the chick could be you know muddy, you know milk chocolate, and you get down to the to the Chickahominy Lake and down to the dam, it's just it's just clear. I mean, what what you're seeing there in that picture, it's it's hardly ever more muddy than that. So I think if if the conductivity gets changed by the turbidity, then yes, you might might mean you have to tweak it. Uh, make some adjustments during a high turbidity time period to to make sure that your sensitivity on the counter is working right for you. Yeah, I, it would just be uh, it would be interesting to try this method in some of our smaller North Carolina streams. You know, some of them are are more turbid, but also some of them are black water streams mm -hmm. as well with just darker, much darker water. So huh, maybe that's something that uh, we can discuss more at length at some at some point in the future. Thanks. Great presentation. Sure, and thanks. And and I'll, I'll since you brought that up, I'll just tell you that I was working with Fish and Wildlife Service to possibly do this at Harrison Lake on Herring Creek, uh, which is a trip to the James. And we found out that Smith Root is no longer making this counter. 
So oh. I need to talk to the other people that are using these. I mean, they'll still repair them. They said something about supply chain uh, issues and there's other counters, but you know, this is, this is really nice the way it's kind of tuned towards counting fish, you know, specifically, for, you know, for what we need to use. So down the road um, and it just works, you know, by the, the fish changing the conductivity as it swims through that tunnel. Uh, so uh -huh. it's just a, you know, uh, a voltage drop. So, I mean, there's, you know, the other ways, maybe someone else makes a counter, but since you brought that up, I'll just mention that, yeah, Smith Root's no longer making these, at least for now. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Appreciate it. Uh, it sure. looks like it's a great tool. It's working real well for you guys. Yep. Thanks, Alan. I think in the interest of sure. time, we'll keep uh, forging ahead. I did assign one question to you. Hopefully, you can see it um, from George Jack. Okay. I guess he had he had two questions. One uh, large question about sort of um, you know where wherein lies you know the the barriers to river herring recovery, which I'm I'm not sure you'll be able to answer. I, I, it's that's a that's a big one. Um, and question two was asking about emigration and and uh, mortality studies for juveniles. So. Um, but you might want to tackle that one. I, I have some question maybe about fallback. If we have dead air in the discussion part, I'll, I'll ask that. Sure. Um, but I uh, want to try and keep us on on schedule as much as we can here. So I'll with, stop presenting. Uh, okay, thanks a lot. Yeah. yeah, thanks for coming and offering to present your, your work. That's good to have strong representation from the Mid-Atlantic from both you and Chelsea. Appreciate that. Um, I'll do it. So our, we're moving into the updates uh, section of our uh, meeting today. Um, <clears throat> our first update is from Kathy uh, Bozek uh, from, she's, I, I think she's in the region here. Um, and she's going to talk a little bit about the uh, funding opportunities under the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, so hopefully, you know, many of you are aware of all the, the different opportunities that are out there and, and obviously just want to make sure we have good awareness there. So um, Kathy should be able to mute and take it away. Thanks. Yeah, can you see my slide okay? It's cut off a little bit. Uh, like the N of national is cut off, but yeah, assuming you don't have too much in the, in the margins, you should be good. Okay, great. Um, yeah, thanks. So my name is Kathy Bozak and I coordinate the National Fish Passage Program from the Fish and Wildlife Service for the Northeast region. Um, I wanted to highlight one of our funding opportunities that we have open now um, and, and make sure that this community that's working on river herring and, and other species that benefit from improved fish passage and aquatic connectivity are aware of this funding opportunity. I do seem to be having trouble with my So the, the National Fish Passage Program um, is a voluntary restoration program. Uh, we work with local communities um, to restore rivers and conserve resources um, by removing or bypassing barriers. So in the Northeast region, we're typically removing dams, um, right-sizing road stream crossings, and in some cases, constructing fishways. And as, as this whole community knows here, um, you know, our projects to remove barriers really benefit both fish and people. Uh, we're having big benefits for communities by reducing flooding, um, removing high hazard dams, um, bringing jobs to local communities, and, and um, improving those resources. And the Fish Passage Program um, has had a lot of success over the, the past decades. Um, and under the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, we received an additional $200 million over five years, so about $40 million a year, um, to fund barrier removal projects across the country. And this program takes priorities um, from our National Fish Passage Program, as well as additional layers of, of priorities from, um, from Bill and the administration, um, including an increased focus on climate change resiliency and benefits for underserved communities. Um, unlike our typical base funding for the National Fish Passage Program um, bipartisan infrastructure law, these projects go up to a national ranking and selection of projects. Um, with our typical ba base funding, we do have a regional selection of projects, but this, this uh, big pot of funding goes up to a national selection. 
And we've had uh, two years of funding go out already in FY22. Um, so this table here shows the national and um, what was funded in the Northeast region specifically. So if you look at the bottom, um, in FY22, we funded six projects in the Northeast region for a little over $5 million total. And in FY23, uh, we funded seven projects. Um, some of those have, have several sites within us, um, one of the projects. And um, we had funding of nearly 7.5 million. So I'm expecting us to stay on this trajectory and have more projects, more funding coming to the Northeast region um, in, in the coming year. And um, this link on the side shows uh, there's a really cool fish passage portal. Um, if you just Google fish passage portal, it'll bring you to this site that has a mapper of all the projects that are funded um, by Fish and Wildlife Service Fish Passage Program under the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, as well as a lot of the other agencies that received funding under Bill uh, for fish passage and barrier removal. So for the Fish Passage Program, um, we have se there are several criteria that um, our projects are assessed against and, and rated and selected for, uh, for funding. You can see the three big bins of criteria are ecological benefits, um, so looking at benefits to priority species and habitat, the permanence of fish passage benefits, you know, will this uh, project continue to provide fish passage um, considering changes in precipitation or changes in the watershed? Um, does it need operations and maintenance to maintain fish passage? Um, and we also look at the re regional and watershed context. Um, the next big bin is the human community benefits, looking at the benefits for communities' resilience to climate change impacts, um, other co-benefits that these projects could provide. Um, there's also a big focus on environmental justice goals and, and projects that would bring benefits to tribal or disadvantaged communities. And the last bin looks at kind of uh, a lot of the logistics, um, looking at partnerships, is there good support for the, the project? Uh, the funding, um, primarily, are there is there leveraged or matching funds? Um, there is not a strict matching requirement, but the matching ratio is considered in the evaluation of the projects. And then the timeline. Um, projects don't need to be entirely shovel ready, but um, there's a priority for projects that could go to construction within one to four years. Um, this is kind of a text heavy slide, but a little more on the funding eligibility and other priorities. Um, the funding range for individual awards is expected to be between 250,000 and 10 million. So we we bumped up the, um, the maximum expected funding amount um, this year. Uh, the eligible activities for funding really range from planning and feasibility up through design, implementation, and um, near-term implementation monitoring as well as capacity to ma manage those project-related uh, activities. Um, like I mentioned before, some projects include multiple project sites. You can bundle those together and have a bigger impact in a watershed. Um, that, that's um, applicable for this funding. And under this notice of funding opportunity that's open right now, um, we are looking to put out our funding from FY24 and potentially FY25. So this is a really good uh, time to apply. Um, if we have a lot of a lot of great projects, we may put out all of the funding for the next two years. Um, so this is a great time to look into this funding opportunity. Um, the process that we go through in in the Northeast region um, it works slightly different across all the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, regions. Um, but for the Northeast, we've been working in state-based work groups um, throughout the summer and early fall to do outreach about this funding opportunity. Um, I know several of you have been part of those. Um, don't fear if you if you haven't, feel free to reach out to me and we can get information to you about the funding opportunity. Um, the official notice of funding opportunity or NOFO was published on October 11th. And we're continuing to have these collaborative discussions with stakeholders um, within each state uh, to discuss the funding opportunity and uh, priority projects. The first official uh, part of the application process is uh, due November 17th, so coming up in a few weeks. Um, it's a pretty easy lift. We just need letter of in 
of interest, um, that can be an email just sent to me with a basic description of the project. Um, if you look in the notice of funding opportunity, there's a few, few bullet points that list out um, what needs to be included in that letter of interest. Um, full applications for select projects will be due January 2nd, and we go through a regional review, send forward our top projects to the national review, and project selections will be announced in the early spring. And if you have any um, additional questions or would like to talk through the funding opportunity, um, and feel free to reach out to me. And I can also connect you to the Fish and Wildlife Service um, fisheries biologist that works in your state um, for further follow-up on the projects. Thanks so much for coming to give us an update on that, Kathy. I think it's a really exciting um, you know, time for, for fish passage, just given the amount of funding that's available and hopefully, you know, we'll get some some great projects on the ground that'll benefit River Harry. Yeah, absolutely. I dropped, I dropped a couple of links in the chat. I think I got the right ones, but if you want to double check and see if there's anything else um, that should be added, um, you know, link, link wise resources for folks that certainly feel free to drop those in the chat. And then I did, so just since your slides were kind of cut off, would, would you be okay with us sharing um, those are the, your slides with the uh, with the distribution, the River Herring Forum distribution after the meeting. Yeah, absolutely. That's fine. Okay. Okay, great. Sorry, I those were cut off. Yeah. I'm not sure why. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was like it was zoomed in or something. We, I think we got most of it. But um, great. I don't see any raised hands, and we are still running a little behind. Um, so, obviously, if folks have questions, we'll circle back during the discussion. Um, section if Kathy has a moment to stay on, um, but if not, obviously Kathy's contact information is there for folks. So, so thank you. <clears throat> Our next update is going to be given by Eric Schultz uh, about the Connecticut River Herring database. All right. Thank you, Jonathan and James, for giving me the opportunity to present. Can you see my screen? And can you yes. see my ugly mug? We can see both. <laughs> OK, all right. Well, let's see. What do I do to minimize this mug so that I can actually see what I'm presenting? All right, we can still see it. Very good. So uh, thank you. I'll, I'll try and stay within, uh, within my time here so that we can catch up um, or maybe not catch up and not lose ground. Um, this uh, update is I want to give you part of a project that we had funded and is now over. We were funded by the Long Island Sound Study, which is a, based, a Sea Grant based project. Um, and uh, it was, as, as I will show you shortly, uh, I had need for a hydrologist. So James Knighton was a hydrologist. Um, Carrie Chadwick is someone with the Center for Land Use Education and Research here. Um, I've been long talking with Allison Roy and Adrian Jordan up at University of Massachusetts about these matters. Um, Zvignu Grabowski is someone who uh, works with CLEAR and uh, this portion of the project, I wanted some real mapping capability, so he came on. And throughout, I've been working with Kevin and, and DEEP. Um, so uh, let's see. I'm going page down here, perhaps. Uh, there we go. Okay. So um, one of our main study sites is is Bride Lake. It's as I'll show you in a little while, our, our largest um, run of alewives in Connecticut. And I noticed that frequently. We had this issue where the water that should be flowing out to the right um, cannot flow because water levels are low. So for a while, I've gotten very interested. I've been very interested in um, the extent to which losses in connectivity for um, some of our alewife runs uh, may be a factor in affecting year class success. And we've made some progress on that. But what I'm going to talk about today is a slightly different objective. Um, one of the objectives in the project was to essentially prepare a database. We, had, we need to prepare a database that included things like water use, hydrology, geospatial characteristics to do the hydro, hydrological modeling that James did. But as part of that, then what I wanted to do was, was aggregate data that had been collected by the DEP and perhaps others 
into a historical river herring passage data set um, into which we could interpose restoration events, um, uh, things like land cover and land use that we were using for the hydrological modeling um, and such have you. And, and the, the, the feeling we've had about this is that it, of course, could provide a basis for the modeling that I just mentioned, but that we could use such things as a resource for future restoration efforts, maybe identify high priority targets um, for researchers to examine things like, you know, going further in this sort of research that had been discussed a little earlier today on run timing, uh, run duration, and what have you, and as importantly, a tool for public engagement. So what we did was we availed ourselves of a number of historical documents, um, and they go back to the 1990s, and I thank people from the DEP to um, doing their best to give me access to some of these historic documents. We have the famous Gephardt reports that started earlier, and that's what you see to the right. And then one other data set I had that I'm really not going to talk about much today. Uh, oh, and by the way, uh, Jacob Gentile is someone who, uh, he, that, that's uh, this handsome fellow who, who did a lot of the digitization for me. And the other data set that I'm not really going to talk about today, but that I think we, we have and that I think um, we want to incorporate into, into the database are, are daily counts. Um, such as the ones we've heard about in, in presentations earlier today. I'm really just going to focus on the annual counts today. And so um, here are the kind of locations that we've been able now to start databasing uh, uh, from uh, these historic uh, counts of the DEP. Um, and uh, the Connecticut River Fishway data sets are not represented here, um, but uh, there are a number, of course, along the Connecticut. Um, and then you see to the right sort of box and whisker plots for each one of these sites that are log of alewife, uh, alewife runs, adult runs going through various kinds of fish counters. Um, and I am going to focus on alewives today for the few remaining slides. So for all the fishways, if we aggregate them over time and we go, we go back to the 1990s, you see here box and whisker plots and um, we, uh, of, of course, for a lot of these runs, they're very small. And so the medians and, and, and the bottom of those boxes do tend to be uh, down at zero. Um, and then the, uh, the dots above the whiskers represent sites in which runs historically are larger. So if we just focus in on now just one run, here's Bry Brook. As I said, that's, that's been sort of our, um, that, that's been our wonder run let's call it, in which we're seeing large numbers um, uh, pretty much every year. Now, we do have data, uh, we do have data from the DEP past 2020. It's, uh, it's just that the, the data sets that we've digitized so far to go to, go to 2020. But, you know, some of the runs since then uh, have dropped down, as I'm sure you guys are aware. So um, into this sort of thing, we can incorporate, and it's going to, it seems to be taking me maybe a little while to advance past that. Um, we can have um, a land cover uh, sort of presentation. Um, so uh, let's see, we are having a little trouble going past that. I guess that let's, let's try a different way of going past this slide. Um, next, mm, doesn't want to load. So I guess it's a data rich slide in which we, oh, there it is. Okay. So uh, here we, we, we can incorporate um, into this database uh, data on impervious land cover, for instance, so that when we really prevent, really have this in a map ready context, and our plan is that anybody wanting to access these data will find it in sort of a map uh, interface in which you can click on a site, you can then get a run size over time, you can get daily run size upon request for any given year, you can see land cover data based on all the layers and what have you. So to be completed then, we want to, we want to prepare a story map so that, so that people from the public, for instance, might be able to see why we're bothering with river, river herring, why we're doing this, and then a, a map user interface. And um, the reason I asked to present this to you today is I know that um, other states have perhaps somewhat analogous efforts. And I really think it would make a heck of a lot of sense for us to be uh, joining forces, um, identifying um, some sort of funding for ongoing data management, um, and, and present things in a much more regional, 
or range-wide basis rather than single state. Um, thank you for your attention. Yeah, thanks, Eric. I think um, I, I imagine you know we could maybe talk a little bit about that sort of larger question um, after our next up. time I talked with Emily should sort of uh, maybe we'll we'll help to address that question but um, I don't want to speak to you Emily I don't know I don't see any raised hands for you there Eric um, and we can we can circle back around but really um, great effort and I um, appreciate you coming to sh share an update with us and I'll with thank that you. I think thank you and you're welcome <laughs> we can um, we can pass it over to Emily um, to present on the Gulf of Maine Riverine Network. So I'm Emily Farr, and I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, give an update on the Gulf of Maine River Herring Network, which I co-facilitate with Mike Talhauser, who is also on the call. Um, and Eric, as um, Jonathan was alluding to, you set us up perfectly to talk a little bit about some of the data aggregation that we're starting to think about. So it would be awesome to follow up and talk more about what that looks like on a region-wide basis. Um, so for those who aren't um, familiar with the Gulf of Maine River Herring Network, we are really focused on advancing collaborative research and co-management of river herring in the Gulf of Maine by providing a forum for regular communication relationship building and identifying collaborative opportunities and projects that we can work on together. Um, and the network is really grounded in bringing a lot of different perspectives together. So we have harvesters, community volunteers, researchers, nonprofits, managers at federal, state, tribal levels, all focused on kind of combining our collective capacities and knowledge to work together on different projects. Um, and we have a lift serve that serves as our kind of primary communications tool in between our meetings. So happy to add anyone to that that would be interested. So one of the things that we've really focused on this past year is ramping up our collaborative monitoring efforts in the network. Uh, this was really based off of some prioritization work that we did last winter to think about collaborative and practical research that can answer both community questions around drivers of migration and movement and variability across systems to start to tease out a lot of the things that Megno was talking about in that system, um, as well as to fill in some gaps in management that um, we can add capacity to as a collective. So we really focused on identifying a couple of key parameters that a lot of different people can easily monitor across different sites in a standardized way um, to complement and kind of standardize a lot of the monitoring that's already happening as well as expand it into new areas. So we landed on focusing on um, ramping up temperature, zooplankton and juvenile um, sampling. So both immigration timing as well as biological data. So here, these are just some photos of some of the folks in the network um, setting up a temperature logger and taking some zooplankton samples. And we were lucky enough to have on the right here, we had two summer interns this year. Um, and this is Emily Rose, one of those interns that supported a lot of this work um, in the down east region of Maine. Um, and we've also been working on developing some simple standardized protocols and data sheets that we developed iteratively with a lot of input from different researchers and managers and people that were already on the ground collecting data to make sure that they were easy to use and understand. Um, and these are, most of them are modified based on existing protocols, but just to try to synthesize in an accessible way to make sure that people are collecting information um, in a similar way across different places. So this is just an example of our juvenile emigration um, data sheet um, and we had a number of folks collecting juvenile samples in different parts of the state of Maine. Um, and let's see if this works here. So just do you see a web page now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so this is just our one of the pages on our Gulf of Maine River Herring Network website, um, the tools page. And just to show, if you go down towards the bottom there, we have all of the protocols and data sheets that we worked on for this effort um, linked there. And then we've also been working on 
a few different like, training videos. So this is a, a zooplankton sampling demonstration. Um, we had a, a build your own zooplankton net workshop for um, folks who didn't already have a net to use um, some kind of readily available things to build a net. So we're we're hoping to keep adding to this. So always happy to add resources and things to our website that people um, would like to see. Um, and then to get to um, what Eric was speaking about, um, one of the other things that we are working on is developing a coastwide river herring shad count data platform. Um, and this is something that we got some funding from the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council to work on. And our goal is really to build on preliminary efforts that have already happened and are happening in different states to capture these counts um, and create a platform where we can pull it all together um, and get an idea of the status of river herring runs coastwide every year. Um, so we had, as I mentioned, two awesome summer interns this year that helped get this platform started and, and develop the framework for it. We got some really helpful feedback from a few state managers and other community members, many of whom are on the call, um, to help us think about refining this. And so we're at a stage now where we're incorporating some of that feedback and working out some bugs and then planning to reach out to a lot more people to get input on making sure that this is useful and usable um, and how we can get more data into some sort of a coastwide platform like this. So um, the main thing that we're looking at is this is just an example of some of the annual count data that's already in the platform from Connecticut and um, Massachusetts and Maine, um, a subset of data. We're also hoping to get some so daily count data for places where that's available um, and ideally bring in some correlates like temperature to look at how that plays out um, for some of these places. Um, and then there's also an option to view and download the data as well as upload additional information. So um, I'd love to talk to anyone about feedback on how we develop this platform and also um, incorporating more data into it. So please um, do reach out to chat either after this or we can talk about it during the discussion as well. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention is one of the other big priorities for us is documenting the role of local stewardship of river herring in both monitoring and really managing and stewarding these runs um, and better understanding kind of the relationship between those stewardship activities and the health and sustainability of these runs. Uh, in Maine, where there's still commercial harvest, there's a really tight coupling between harvest and commercial stewardship. And there's tons of work by community volunteers and local organizations um, in making sure that these runs are continuing um, and growing. So we are planning to, we're about to embark on a project where we're going to really document the specific stewardship activities that are happening. How much time are people putting in? What are they doing? Who's doing it? Um, and start to answer these questions about the relationship with run health and really what happens if we lose some of this um, stewardship work. So that's all I have. Um, this is Mike and my contact information, um, a link to our network website. And yeah, happy to answer any questions if there's time. Yeah, thanks, Emily. Um, <clears throat> really, Good, great work going on up there, and I'm um, happy to, you know, open it up here for a question or two. If uh, folks are interested, please, please raise your hand or enter it into the chat. Okay, well, at the very least, I will make sure we connect you with Eric um, so that you guys can kind of compare notes on, on your sort of overlapping efforts there. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it's a big undertaking. I, I certainly, you could see some serious value there um, in you know, developing a coastwide reporting tool. I think, you know, it would help sort of sort of answer some of those questions about, well, what's going on at a, at a coastwide scale or a regional scale or in my state? Um, and, and obviously there's a lot of different data sources out there, but um, so hopefully that's something that can continue. Um, and yeah, appreciate um, both of your efforts there. So, thank you. With that, I am actually the next um, updater here. Um, and 
we'll, after this, we'll open it up to um, just you know, general updates if anybody has anything and or um, discussion. So I, I put myself last at the at the updates section here just to talk about the initial survey results. I've got about we've had about 36 people, I think it was respond thus far to the survey that we sent out um, with a couple of emails associated with this meeting. But essentially this stems from you know conversations I've been having with James and the experiences I've had since I came on board to um, co-lead the co-chair the forum with with uh, ASMC. Um, you know, we, we have two meetings a year. That's how it's been done since about 2018, I think, when they started out, when they switched names to the River Herring Forum in 2016, I believe they met four times a year. Um, and, you know, along the way, we've been sort of iteratively learning, trying to streamline the process, make sure that everybody's actively engaged. Um, and one thing we were kind of discussing was, you know, especially in the spring meeting, we've had, uh, it's it's been a bit of a challenge, I guess, to get you know a full schedule there, um, just to make sure that you know we're, we're presenting content that's of interest to everybody here. So um, one thing we were kicking around the idea with and wanted to open it up to this group uh, for discussion and obviously in the survey, um, just to hear your thoughts was we're talking about moving it, uh, changing the frequency of our meetings to one meeting per year, potentially. Um, extending the duration of that meeting to accommodate, you know, presentations that come in. Generally, we're able to accommodate everybody who submits a presentation, which is great. Um, but yeah, just really wanted to see, you know, how that struck everyone. Um, you know, if they felt that one meeting per year um, was going to be sufficient to cover the topics that are of interest to them. Um, and the other thing we've talked about was, well, you know, We'll definitely keep it to one meeting per year. We may have a second meeting, you know, should a special session maybe um, in a given year if there is something of interest happening. So um, one way this could look moving forward is say next year, once the results of the benchmark stock assessment are available, um, we could have a special session to review those results uh, with everybody here. Obviously, you know, bring the right folks in the room to answer any questions that you may have. Um, and that would be sort of our special session sometime, you know, next fall. Um, and then we would, you know, start a annual meeting. Right now, most folks have indicated that winter was the best time frame for them. Um, so anyway, this is just sort of a, a hypothetical. We can move from doing one meeting in the spring, one meeting in the fall, as we have been doing the last couple of years, to doing, you know, one meeting annually, potentially over the winter. Um, to avoid any of those difficulties with uh, you know, meeting during sampling season and things like that, um, and make sure that we have just a really solid um, slew of presentations every go round. So, um, like I said, I've, we've gotten about 36 uh, respondents to the survey, and I will drop the survey link in the chat. So if you are so inclined, um, um, you should be able to respond and I'll, I'll send out a couple of reminders. I think we're going to close this um, survey around mid-November and we'll circle back with dates for next year around the end of this calendar year. Um, but really the, the goal is just to kind of give you guys a preview of what the results were, which is essentially, you know, most folks are amenable. Um, I think it was like 70% of folks were amenable to moving to one meeting per year with special sessions as needed to cover particular topics of interest like that benchmark stock assessment. And again, winter is that best time frame. So, um, you know, with that, I gave myself 10 minutes in, in the hopes that, you know, folks would chime in and say, that sounds great. Let's keep it down to one, you know, one meeting a year. I think that seems reasonable, or I really like the two meeting a year, <laughs> um, you know, format, and I, I'd like to advocate for that. So, um, wanted to offer folks a chance to raise their hands and speak on behalf of either one of those perspectives or, you know, offer different thoughts about, you know, how we move together as a forum um, and just making sure that, that, you know, this has maximum utility for everybody sitting there, you know, tuning in um, every every meeting, which has been, the attendance has been great. So, um, I, you know, this is a call for folks to raise their hands and um, speak on behalf of changing the meeting frequency. And we have no hands. <laughs> I 
but maybe we have one more response in the uh, survey, which is great. <laughs> Uh, Rory, uh, if James can unmute you, you can go ahead and. Hey, Dalton. We can hear you. Okay. Uh, just a question, I suppose. Um, are, are you doing the survey because you've got some feedback that um, people want it changed, or are you just doing it to check in, you know, for the go to the order sort of a thing? Because I think my response would change depending on the answer to that question, if that makes sense. Right. So I've gotten a little bit of feedback on the spring meeting um, has been tough for folks to attend because it usually falls right in the middle of the sampling season. Um, so there has been that that concern has been raised uh, and that's been coupled by, you know, our experience trying to find presentations for that spring meeting has been tougher the last couple of years than filling the fall agenda. Um, we've had maybe one or two presentations the last couple of spring meetings. Um, you know, there's in the river herring world, maybe two, three, four papers a year published, I would say. Um, so I just want to make sure that we're not exhausting, I guess, the pool of presenters and, you know, one meeting a year may be all we need to, you know, cover all those, say, publications or studies that are coming out in a particular year. So that was kind of, those were kind of the two factors that led us to kind of ask this question. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to see the survey was just really a chance to, to hear everyone's feedback on yeah, frequency of meeting because we haven't checked in at least since I've been co-chair. So wanted to check in on that. Do you have any other do you have any response to that, Rory? Um just First of all, thanks um, for checking in. And second of all, it doesn't seem to be broken to me. I'm not able to, <laughs> so, you know, what are you trying to fix? So, you know, I, I, I'm not able to participate all the time, but when I do, you know, it's usually worth my time. So um, that's kind of where my question was coming from. And I'll, you know, I'll take a look at the survey. And um, yeah, I, I think it's great that you're checking in though, Jonathan. Thanks for doing it. Yeah, yeah, no, it's point, point well made. Um, you know, if it's not broken, why fix it? Um, I, I think, Part of it's just been, yeah, it's been it's been tough to track down presenters for that spring meeting. It's it's taken some legwork on our end <laughs> to uh, kind of kind of poke folks and say, hey, you want to come present in the spring? Um, so that uh, part of it is, you know, maybe trying to kind of look out for our, our workload and, and just make sure that, gee, the, the interest really is there to meet in the spring or it's not convenient for most folks and it's tough to get presenters. So why don't we meet once annually? That was kind of where it came from. Um, ben, German, I think you've got your hand raised. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, uh, definitely, definitely understand a concern over, you know, making sure we have enough presentations for, for a spring meeting. Um, I know that has been a, an issue in the past. One, uh, maybe third option I thought I might float here to just further confuse things is what, what would happen if we kept two meetings, but the winter meeting was the presentation heavy meeting and maybe the spring meeting was like an hour and was just updates, check-in kind of deal without any um, scientific presentations. Just a, just a thought. Yeah, that, I was laying awake at night last night thinking about just that, like do, do they have to follow the same format that spring and fall meeting? Um, I mean, maybe we didn't, I don't know that we had an open-ended response in the survey just to keep the the, the interpretation simple, but I think that's a fine point. Um, and, you know, folks are certainly um, able to email us and advocate for that as well. So um, I'm not going to go back and change the survey now, probably, <laughs> but uh, it's a good point. Uh, Ruth, you got your hand raised. Go ahead. Yeah, actually, I was going to kind of suggest the same thing um, and just have, you know, the spring meeting just be updates and you know more of an open discussion uh, and and not as long because i'm afraid also if you went to one meeting then you would probably want to have it longer and i feel like especially a virtual meeting is this is just long enough to me <laughs> yeah totally 
yeah, that, that was part of the concern was if we condense it down to one meeting or we end up sitting in a, on a virtual meeting for an entire day to accommodate all the people who expressed interest in presenting, you know, I know there's definitely some fatigue there. You know, that said, I, at the at this sort of juncture in the meeting, generally, um, at least since I've been co-chairing, uh, when we open it up for general discussion, um, usually we end there early. Um, I don't, you know, obviously sort of being virtual maybe makes that kind of people aren't really ready to sh like raise their hand and say, here's what I've found in my certain area or like little tidbits that they want to share. But a lot of times, I mean, with, with the exception of, you know, several folks that show up to every meeting, um, a lot of times, you know, it is, it is tough to get that kind of discussion going at the end of the meeting. So I want to make sure um, we can hold the meeting, um, certainly for to have that discussion and, and allow for updates, but I want to make sure that everybody is feeling like they're getting value out of that and, and participating and feeling, you know, empowered to participate in that, in that way. So um, we can, we could certainly move to that model and, um, and see if the discussion is, is robust or, and if it's not, we can, I mean, we can, we can always kind of keep tweaking it to fit everybody's schedule. So that's, that's certainly the goal here is to, to make sure that, you know, when you guys call in, you're getting a lot of value out of, out of the forum. Okay. James, did you have anything to add to that? Well, before we move over to just general discussion and updates and who knows after I say that maybe we'll have lots but no nothing more to add I think these are really good thoughts and I, I'm glad we had a chance to discuss it now to flesh out some additional ideas that, that we didn't capture in, in the survey so really glad to hear what everybody's thoughts are thanks yeah great <laughs> okay um, so now we're shifting into we've got about 30 minutes left in the agenda um, and we're going to shift over to the section of the meeting that's just free range um if folks have updates you can raise your hand give an update on what you've been working on that would be interesting to, to everybody here um or the opportunities um research asks i know i've sent out at least one research ask this year uh uh from oh gosh i can't remember the fellow's name but looking for training data to, uh, to train a fish counter model. Um, so obviously, thank you to those who participated in that. Hopefully someone did. I never did hear back um, on the status of that. But um, yeah, so raise your hands, share your updates if you, and we'll maybe give that a minute. Um, questions, updates, discussion. Um, and then once we move through that, maybe we'll try and circle back uh, to some of these questions that we didn't get a chance to discuss. Um, we've heard those presenters who are still around. So with that, I will kind of just wait a minute and see if folks want to raise their hand and share with the group. Thanks. Kevin, go ahead. Yeah, I just figured I'd share. We're going to be working with uh, USGS and Ken Sprankle at US Fish and Wildlife next spring. We're going to put out uh, hopefully over 100 each, um, shooting for close to 150 each acoustic tags um, on alewives and blueback herring in the Connecticut River. We're going to set those tags to last for hopefully a year. We'll see. Um, and look at habitat use in the river and then where they are at sea. So I know a couple other groups are doing similar things. So if anybody is interested, feel free to reach out to either us here at Connecticut DEP or Ken Sprankle at U.S. Fish and Wildlife um, for more details on that. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Kevin. Um, Ken Sprankle, I guess if you want to go ahead and follow on there, go ahead.
we take this game down. Entrance designs um, and responses of river herring in their uh, large flume building. So these are going to be paired to Neil Fishways, which are really focused on uh, different treatments as far as the depth, depth and width of the entrances uh, relative to velocities um, and other, you know, hydrodynamic measures. And so uh, working with Connecticut DEP, the expectation is we'll, uh, you know, that they'll be able to get alewife. Um, we're not so sure about the blueback herring. That, that can be challenging. Um, and, uh, you know, electrofishing, we've got some concerns with that. But anyways, that, that study um, is going to be uh, started this spring. So that's, uh, I think, will be of interest to folks. And I can provide more information on that proposal. It's with um, Bjorn Lake is involved with, with that, uh, the Fish Passage Engineers for Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and the Fish and Wildlife Service providing, you know, some funding, not all the money they need, but, you know, a, a fair amount of uh, funding support for that. And can you, I don't know if anybody, everyone else experienced this, but your audio didn't cut in until maybe you had, like, said your first sentence or two. So can you just... Um, is this this is a, 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 a study that's happening at, at Conti or um... yes yeah correct so it's it's uh, it's a laboratory based study in their flume building for people that are familiar with it so um, it's going to be uh, well it's going there's going to be CFD study for uh, the entrance conditions but again the focus is on different entrance design configurations uh, to explore differences in the amount of water to, to operate, you know, 30 CFS for a standard Daniil and, you know, if you, if you can change the configuration and perhaps operate it at five or 10 CFS and, and just see how the fish behave, behave right, as they uh, approach and whether or not they, they enter, um, because that's always, uh, well, we've heard about the problems with the turn pools, which folks are aware of, but entrances are always, uh, you know, of substantial uh, concern uh, as folks know. So this is really what that this coming study is designed uh, to look at with some different treatments. Is that does that cover yeah. anything, yeah, yeah. Jonathan? Yeah, I think okay. I think so. I think that'll be really, really interesting. And I, I know I've heard Bjorn talk about it a little bit. So you know when um you know Cody presented on the passage efficiency for that um Daniel Fishway um up in maine i mean it it seems like there's still some some you know fruit to bear there in terms of answering some of those questions around tweaking those specific design features so i think that's, that's really really neat and hopefully will help to further the science there so, yeah thanks. thanks nick go ahead Thanks, Jonathan. Can you hear me okay? Awesome. Hi, everyone. Um, so kind of building off of Kathy Bozik's presentation on Fish and Wildlife Service funding, um, coming up probably sometime early to mid-new year uh, will be the Department of Transportation's Culvert and Aquatic Organism um, Passage Funding Opportunity. And I just wanted to share that with this group. Many of you have probably heard of it before or are interested, but it will be open. Um, it's $200 million towards Culvert Rehab, heat rehab and replacement. Um, and with the topic being river herring of this group, uh, there may be some culverts. Uh, folks want to talk to their local DLT, DOTs or municipalities about replacing. So I'll put a link in the chat um, to last year's funding opportunity and results. Take a look at that and um, feel free to reach out. Uh, NIMS and Fish and Wildlife Service are providing DOT some um, support in this funding opportunity as far as technical assistance. So happy to discuss with this group um, offline by email or at another time. And thank you. Yeah, Nick, uh, great plug. I know we emailed about this last week. Um, you know, at least in the state that I work in, Maryland, mainly in Maryland, you know, it, it really relies that, the state DOT seems like they would be the one to bring those culverts forward. I know, you know, states have different models where um, the state DOTs might have more coordination with the different, um, you know, resource agencies. But, um, you know, if 
those state DOTs aren't interested in pursuing the funding. Nobody's, you know, you know, it's kind of they need to be made aware, I guess, that it's it, that culvert culverts are a concern if they're not already um, for River Herring Passage, and I think it's a really good opportunity for them to get some funding to, you know, replace some of their culverts and also do so in a manner that's helpful for, for River Herring. So, you know, just just so folks are aware, it's, we can be it's it's something that at least depending on what seat you sit in it's you know at least where i'm sitting with, with no fisheries in the habitat division trying to bring it to the maryland state dot to say hey can you guys are you guys going to put in any <laughs> um applications for this funding opportunity because gee we've got you know these populations in mid-atlantic blueback area that could really use some help and um there's funding on the table so you know, every little bit helps if you have connections there. I think just to sort of encourage folks to pursue these funding opportunities is it's a, it's a good time to do that. So, Ken, I believe your hand is left over. Um, but Ken Sprinkle, if you had anything, you're welcome to add it. And Kathy, Kathy, can I go ahead and put this um, link in the chat to everybody? On the, on the, the, um... Yes, I, I didn't see that option. I was trying to find it. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's like at the bottom, you can kind of choose who your, the audience of your chat is. So folks should be able to see that. And let's see, Nick also put. I'm not sure you can see what in terms of questions versus chat, but obviously just want to make sure that everybody's seeing all these different resources that folks are kind enough to share. Um, Karen Lindbergh, please um, go ahead. Hi, um, it's been interesting listening to everything. Um, I uh, just wanted to ask if um, whoever it was who was talking about putting trackers on um, her uh, river herring to see where they go out to sea, if you do get mortalities from that, um, please let me know because I do a lot of biomarker work. I'm looking. I look at otoliths and um, various other tissues, uh, and tr um, you know, been one of my holy grails has been to try to figure out if we can um, sort of geolocate where fish come from by the chemistry of these various body parts. So. Um, if you do have some mortalities, and this goes for everybody who's doing this kind of work, uh, please get in touch with me. Um, maybe, you know, save the fish. We can discuss how to get them to me. That would be really great. So just to be clear, you want whole fish frozen or just otoliths or what do you, what exactly would well, you want? I would, I would, I would take, I would take heads if that's all you want to do, but yeah. Whole bodies are good. Okay, I, I can um if that if it suits, I'll send that out to the distribution. Awesome. Right, we can. I'm sure folks get their hands on fish on yeah. mortalities. You know that some of the folks some care. of the folks who are on this meeting I know uh, have been contacted by Jeff Kip for me to um, amass their um, their shad with collections and lend them to me. I have a visitor coming from Spain uh, next week who is an expert in otolith shape analysis. And we're going to be looking across the span from Florida to Canada, I think, fingers crossed, and uh, also over time to look for changes, uh, to just see if we can discriminate things. And, you know, ultimately try to relate that to environmental variables too. So uh, we'll see if, if it holds water or not. but. The, the you know the the species ranges that we have are very special these allocenes and we can do a lot with that and my last question for you is what kind of if we if you got a, a cooler full of heads what kind of biological data would you want with them i mean i assume location date total length everything That's everything <laughs> yeah um okay what, what their birthdays were. No, we could figure that out probably. <laughs> yeah, I think we'll leave that to you. Um, okay, 
Great. I, I know of at least yeah, one sort of survey survey effort going on here in Maryland. We could probably get you some fish. Um, so I'll coordinate with you offline. Um, awesome. Thank you. Happy, happy to do it. If, if uh, Chesapeake, you, you want them from everywhere, I assume. There's no particular geography that's of interest. Um, you know, I think we're all kind of in the dark about what, what um, river herring really do out at sea, kind of. Um, so the more that we can, the more ways we can we can um, try to figure it out, the better, I think. Do you only want fish that are collected at sea? Did I miss that? No, no. I, I, if they're if they've been if they have trackers so that the records are available, then if they're caught back in the spawning grounds, that's great. Okay. Great. All right. I think I saw a question in the question box from Joshua Wright. You seem to be in support of the two meetings per year. And his second question was, has DFO um, participated in this network or is it just U.S.? Um, I know we have certainly had some folks from, from Canada, from DFO, sit in on some of these meetings. I could look back through our distribution. There's definitely a few folks on the distribution list from DFO. Um, so it's certainly open to folks, um, you know, our Canadian neighbors. And if you guys have connections up there, um, obviously, Happy to have them participate here, you know, share their research in terms of what they're learning uh, up there in, in Canadian rivers and and uh, learn from the, the great work that's going on here in the States. So, um, yeah, I, I think we have some participation. I, I'm not familiar with the structuring of their program to tell you if it at what level, um, but definitely have been present in the past. Okay. Any other hands? Kara, yours is still up, but I assume that's left over. And that confirms that. Bill Post, go ahead. Uh, request. Karin, how many fish do you want? Do you have a specific number? No, this was spontaneous. So, uh, you know, what, whatever we, I mean, if we wanted to try to do some looking and then see if it looks promising, you know, that that's kind of my my thinking at the moment. So start with 50? Oh man, if you have 50 fish that you've tracked and you know their locations, that is pretty awesome. I think I might be in Bill Post mode and just, so you want fish with known, you want odalis from fish, ideal or some structures, hardened structures from fish yeah. that you've known to go out to sea and then come back. Right, I'd like to know where, where they're spending their time. And um, so we, we can correlate, you know, various biomarkers with, with that where we can attempt it, right? And that would allow us, um, you know, because those are natural tags that stay with the fish throughout life, then we have a means of expanding the understanding if we can get some validation. So, you know, uh, this is basically a very spontaneous proposal for a pilot study. Um, if it looks like it's interesting and if people, you know, if people have known known histories of fish, if it looks interesting, then perhaps we could pursue some um, means of expanding the study. Okay. I think I I think I misunderstood. I thought you were just looking for odalis from from all fish that you may get your hands on, but um or or from oh no heads or, oh no I got plenty. You, okay, <laughs> I figured you would. Um, okay, so no, fish that you yeah. kind of knew where chemistry, they were hanging out. Chemistry costs actually. money. Yeah, chemistry costs money. Yeah. So um, uh, yeah, it would be it would have to be special fish that we know something about. Yeah. Thanks for the I'm not sure how, Yeah, I'm not sure how often that happens, but obviously Kevin Job 
um, if you picked up on that request, you might be in a good spot to, to provide some of those biological samples to Karen. To Karen. I think that'd be great. Any um, thoughts on the work being done um, in Connecticut or in the Gulf through the Gulf of Maine River Herring Network on tracking uh, in terms of you know having multiple different data sources, um, you know weekly reporting numbers, annual run counts. Is there anything that folks would find particularly interesting or useful um, from you know somebody putting together a unified database of coastwide run counts or do you feel like those data are available through the stock assessment um, framework, or is it just you, yeah, I'm mostly working in my state, so you know, not not too interested in what's going on in North Carolina, or just curious as far as you know that that concept has struck folks. Are they interested in, in um, do they see utility you know for their own work or for others? Kevin, yeah, I think that would be a huge help. As many people on this call know, I kind of just cold called everybody this spring all up and down the coast so having that somewhere where we could see it would be um i think a really really big help for us trying to yeah, understand you, you know, do you, downturns do you want to know it in i mean it sounds like you want to kind of know in real time like hey i'm in connecticut i'm seeing this what are they seeing no no just to look back in time you know if at the end of the season you know it's for me like working uh, with Eric and Emily, that was kind of a big thing for us was to be able to like, you know, at least for Connecticut, have something we could share and say, here, look, this is 1999 to, you know, the end of this spring. This is what we're working with. Um, it seems like it's been, you know, received positively by other people around the coast. So something like that for, you know, looking at some of these numbers from Virginia, uh, we have, you know, we have no idea what's going on in those places. So it helps us when we're looking at, you know, collapse or, you know, success. Got it. Yeah, I know that I believe Emily worked on the Northeast Regional Habitat Assessment Data Explorer, which did a similar, um, you know, achieved a similar feat, which was taking data from so many different sources and surveys and kind of putting them all in one data viewer. Um, and it's it's a really interesting thing to kind of to look through. Um, I think if you look for that shiny app, the Northeast Regional Habitat Assessment Data Explorer, folks should be able to find it. Any other thoughts on, let's see, Ken Sprankle said he agrees, you know, coast-wide updates would be of value um, along the coast. I hear you there, Josh. Um, and Joshua Roy noting that could be really interesting to look at those systems where you've had fish passage improvements and look at run count changes over time there. Um, it can help sort of make that case for, you know, for further work saying, hey, look, you know, Penobscot River did fish passage and now they have, you know, over 2 million fish returning in a couple of years. Not that everybody sees those kind of numbers, but um, certainly is a, a powerful example to showcase and, and Viewers like that can be really helpful in that. Oh, six million. Sorry there, Joshua. <laughs> um, Range-wide view of migration success and climate shifts would be great. Yeah, I think, you know, we're all sort of, sh the whole purpose of this group and, and one of the big challenges with river herring is we are all familiar with our runs in our own area, but trying to synthesize that out to ask questions about how they're doing on a coast-wide scale, it's it's a big challenge. Um, and And as somebody else, noted in their questions earlier, um, you know, what do we attribute the lack of recovery to in some systems? It's it's a big question. It's something we, you know, try to touch on in the um, Atlantic Coast River, or the, sorry, the River Herring Habitat Conservation Plan. That actually was also included in the survey. Didn't really talk about those results. Um, I will put a link to that in the chat for folks who haven't had a chance to read it. Um, obviously welcome folks to speak on the utility of that resource have you had a chance to read it have did you find things in there that you had questions about or um you know that's another thing we could talk about today we got you know about nine minutes left here so feel free to chime in and i'll put that in the chat
All right, things are slowing down here. Um, last chances to ask any questions or offer any updates. Anything of interest you saw this spring? Want to share with the group? I guess while I'm waiting, I, I did have a chance to tour the Herring River restoration uh, project out on Cape Cod this spring and was really blown away by the level of, you know, community participation in, um, you know, daily survey run counts. Um, and honestly, pretty blown away by how many fish returned to such a small system, coastal system. It's um, pretty neat uh, and a neat area and a neat project to, to keep track of as they continue on that. Um, work. I think they've gotten under construction this year. So um, neat one there. Uh, a couple other restoration projects were highlighted in the appendix to the um, River Area Habitat Conservation Plan. I think um, those may be of interest to folks. The, the whole intention of that section was to give folks sort of a sense of the flavor of how you go about undertaking a restoration project, who the partners are, what the challenges are. It was, we really wanted to get down into the granularity necessary to, you know, kind of Form this culture of learning that uh, you know the River Herring Network, um, or the sorry the forum and the network for that matter, um, try to foster. So, so yeah. With that, um, last call for hands questions. I think we got a thanks from Alan Weaver. Obviously, huge thanks to all of our presenters and updaters today. Um, really appreciate everybody. You know especially for those folks who repeatedly come back to the forum and share what they've been working on with the group really appreciate it if you haven't shared what you've been working on with the group consider it we're always happy to hear it and um you know just want to use this as a place where we can compare notes and ask questions um you know it's a, it's a unique group of folks representing you know state federal ngo um you name it we're all here in one room twice a year at this point and um, you know we'll continue to be so really appreciate everyone's continued participation we'll send out a meeting summary email after this with a couple of links Kathy Bozek slides um, the research asked from Karen Lindbergh and I'll probably run that language by you Karen just to make sure you don't get a bunch of uh, you know fish heads that aren't of use to you um, and yeah, I think that was, that's where it's sort of the main things I had. Um, and then we'll provide information on where you can find the recording of the meeting, especially for folks that um, weren't able to make it, so. James, did you have any parting words to share with the group? Nothing else except to reiterate our thanks for everybody who presented and everybody who joined this afternoon. And if you haven't filled out the survey, please, please do so. We'll leave it open for a little bit. Um, but again, thanks for providing additional comments today, and we'll uh, get back to it with everybody with what we plan for in the future. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I think I left that survey up until the, I wanted to say I said the 15th of November, essentially I was going to put on my last call with the meeting summary email to say, if you haven't weighed in yet, weigh in now. Um, so please do, please weigh in. Um, even if you weighed in verbally today, would appreciate just having it all there um, in the survey, and we will, uh, We'll let you know how we're going to proceed. Again, the intention is just to make sure that you know you guys are finding these meetings useful and the discussion has, you know, a lot of is very information dense and it's not sort of repeats of the same thing you heard last time or um, you know, whatever it may be. So just want to make sure that folks are feeling like it's a good use of your time and and uh, we can continue to tailor it to 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 be that exactly. So thanks folks. This has been great. Great. Thanks everyone. Yeah, thank you all. We'll see you next time. And happy Halloween. <laughs> <laughs>